what he did. Yeah, especially what he was. George was not sick. George had been out and about. But you never Until you opened the book. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issue before us tonight. If you wish to speak on an agenda item tonight, please go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those of you who wish to speak, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium. Please speak clearly and into the microphone. Each side, those speaking in favor of an item and those speaking in opposition to an item, will have 10 minutes to present for each side. The time will be divided among all persons wishing to speak. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. Can I have the roll call, please? Mr. Alter? Present. Mr. Bryan? Present. Mr. Busby? Present. Ms. Freeman? Present. Mr. Ghosh? Present. Mr. Gibbs? Present. Mr. Harris? Present. Mr. Hornbuckle? Present. Ms. Hyman? Present. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kinchin, Mr. Miller, Present. Mr. Van, Present. Mr. Whitley. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, Commissioner um, Johnson has requested an excused absence, so I need a motion to <coughs> approve Ms. excused uh, absence. Out. Chair Hammond, I believe uh, Mr. Kinchin asked for an excused absence as well via email. Okay. Uh, you were copied. I don't know if you saw it, but he did actually send one. Request. Madam Chairman, <clears throat> excuse me. I move that we excuse Armir Kinchin and um, Mr. Cedric Johnson from uh, attendance tonight. Second. Motion by Commissioner Miller. Second by Commissioner Busby that Commissioner Kitchen and Commissioner Johnson be excused uh, from the, the meeting tonight. All in favor of this motion, please raise your right hand. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Next item we have is the approval of the minutes and consistency statements for the February 14, 2017 meeting. Chair recognizes Commissioner Bryan. I uh, have what I believe is a minor correction. Um, it's page four at the top. When we're dealing with uh, the Andrews Chapel, I believe that the motion actually carried 13 to zero because even though Mr. Al Turk had left, uh, Commissioner Ghosh was no longer recused. So that would have given us 13. Thank you. Are there other corrections to the minutes? Madam Chair, I move the approval of the minutes as corrected. Second. Motion by Commissioner Miller, 
second by Commissioner Brine that we approve the minutes with corrections. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by raising your right hand, please. All opposed? Madam Clerk. Motion carries 11 to 0. The next item, adjustments to the agenda. Um, yes, uh, Grace Smith Planning. Staff would um, re recommend or suggest that the commission consider moving item 6C to the uh, beginning of public hearings under um, section 6 because we will be, uh, the staff does intend to ask for a 60 day or two cycle continuance based on the applicant desiring to make some changes to that plan. And I know some people are here signed up to speak and it um, might be helpful for them if they don't have to wait through the other hearings. If we continue that hearing, that's totally up to the commission. Just a, a recommendation or suggestion. Madam Chairman, I move that we move items 6C, cases A16-0015 and Z16-0035 uh, up to uh, the first position in uh, chapter six of our agenda. Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Miller, second by Commissioner Busby, that we move item A160015 and Z160035, uh, 1900 Hillendale, uh, to first position under the public hearing six category. All in favor of this motion, raise your right hand. Thank you. We'll move it to first position. Okay, and uh, one last thing, uh, Chair Hyman. Uh, staff can um, affirm that all legal notices have been carried out in compliance with local and state law and affidavits for those are on file in the planning department. Thank you. Thank you. Item number five, public. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that we adopt the agenda as amended. Second. It has been moved and properly second by Commissioner Harris and Commissioner Bryan that we adopt the agenda as presented. Correct. As corrected, thank you. Amended. <laughs> Amended. Corrected. Uh, all in favor of this motion, uh, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Now can we move to item number five. A public hearing, comprehensive plan, future land use map amendments. It has none. So, okay, <laughs> since there are none, then item number six, public hearing, comprehensive plan, future land use map amendments with concurrent zoning map changes. And we have moved um, item number C up to first position. The chair recognizes um, staff. Good evening, Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Um, as Assistant Director Smith noted, staff um, would recommend a continuance of up to 60 days for this item. It's my understanding from the applicant that they are requesting um, or contemplating, I should say, some changes to their development plan. Um, staff does not or has not had an opportunity to review those. So I believe a continuance would be helpful so that staff can evaluate those changes and bring them to the commission when they're ready. Cycles. Two cycles, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair. Uh, Chair recognizes Commissioner Harris. Madam Chair, I'd like to honor the applicant's request and have a two cycle continuance for uh, case number a160015 in zoning case 160035. Second. No. Um, question. Madam Chair, I believe staff said there were people here to speak. Uh, and we have, if we're going to continue, don't we have to open the public hearing anyway? I just wanted to make sure that if there were people who were opposed to or wanted to be heard on the question of the continuance motion before us, that we hear them before we vote. Um, so I'm, 
it, it looks like I'm going to open the public hearing so that these individuals have an opportunity. Well, first of all, let me check with um, staff. Is that because this is this is a little bit since we're continuing at two cycles. So you have a motion and a second on the floor. So you need to decide how you're going to dispose of that. And then if you want to open the hearing, that's certainly the applicant can speak for a few minutes and explain his position. And if, if they uh, and if anyone in attendance has questions, we can certainly answer those questions. Um, however, there is a motion and a second on the floor. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and um, we have a motion uh, by Commissioner Harris and a second by Commissioner Brine that we continue item number A1600015 and Z1600035 for two cycles. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by a roll call vote. Mr. Al Turk? Yes. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Ms. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. Mr. Miller. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I did. I'm sorry. Did I call everyone? Do I get to vote twice in every case? <laughs> no. Motion carries unanimous. I'll take credit for that. Since the item has carried and we're uh, at forward two cycles, there are individuals here who have signed up to speak. Um, are those individuals still interested in speaking? Let's open the public hearing for those individuals and let's see if uh, the applicant would like to make a statement. And the, uh, so I have Tony Tate who is here for, okay. And the applicants, uh, I have three applicants, Olivia Moore, Daniel Kasten, and Tom Clark. Yes. Madam Chair, my name is Tony Tate. I'm a landscape architect. I'm a landscape architect here in uh, 5011 South Park Drive here in Durham. I am here representing the um, um, applicant in this case, and he is, he is requesting a 60-day deferral on this case for us to make some adjustments to the conditions of the plan, and so we're, that's why we're asking for the deferral. We're, Thank you. We've not completed those, so we're just asking for that. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, yes. and that we have no idea what the Change request the is, I don't, I, I don't know what what the uh, community can speak to since we don't know what the plans are. Um, so we will just, the item, the individuals here with, will withdraw, so there will be no further comment to this. Thank you. The next item. Uh, yeah, Excuse me, Chair. Um, Hyman, so sort of, did you all actually open the public hearing? Mm -hmm. You need to continue it again just procedurally yeah. oh that's right yes um I move we continue the public hearing okay uh motion by commissioner brian and second by commissioner freeman that we continue the public hearing uh, two cycles all in favor of this motion let it be known by raising your right hand Motion carries unanimous, 11 to 0. Thank you. Wow, that was awesome. The next item that we have, um, item number 
A160006 and uh, item Z160001601201 Ellis Road. Staff report, please. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins again with the planning department. Um, this is a case for property located at 1201 Ellis Road. Uh, the applicant is Dan Ryan Builders. This is within the city of Durham's jurisdiction. Uh, the request is to change the zoning designation of this parcel from residential rural to plan development residential 7.870, and also to modify the future land use map of the comprehensive plan from low density residential to low medium density residential for the site. Um, the site is approximately 22.8 acres in size and the applicant is proposing a maximum of 180 townhouse units for this project. Uh, context map, um, noting, the, noting this area, um, as you can see it, the, the property fronts along Ellis Road and is just to the east of the Riddle Road at Ellis Road intersection. Uh, zoning in the area, primarily a mix of residential rural, um, industrial. Um, there is a PDR zoning designation to the south of this site. <coughs> Some requirements of the PDR district for this project. Um, maximum impervious coverage. The applicant has committed to a maximum of 70%. A maximum building height of 35 feet. 20% tree preservation. And they are committing to only townhouse units. The existing conditions, um, which is seen as part of the development plan packet, or package, I should say, in your packet. Um, the black hatching notes the environmentally sensitive features at the subject site, and the remainder of the site is primarily a mix of hardwood forests. Proposed conditions. Um, as you can see, the applicant is indicating the townhouse units for this potential access points, as well as some potential stream crossings. Um, as you can see on the northern property boundary, the applicant is dedicating 61 feet of right-of-way. Uh, the transportation department requested a 50-foot reservation for this area. The end result of the dedication would mean that the applicant would not be required to provide a buffer along that northern property boundary. Um, a summary of the commitments, again, as I noted, the applicant is committing to a maximum of 180 townhouse units, roadway improvements along Ellis Road, uh, their site access points, a building and parking envelope, riparian buffers, and potential stream crossings. Um, a summary of the design commitments, um, the applicant is not committed to any particular architectural style, sloped roofs one or more um, exterior building surface materials as seen on the development plan and distinctive features include front facing gables and or entry porches and or window shutters. A look at the future land use map. Um, as you can see on the left hand side the existing conditions um, noting this is this property is low density residential and industrial to the north the applicant is requesting to go to low medium density. The policies reviewed as part of this, um, as it currently stands, the site is not consistent with the low density residential designation, which is why they are requesting the low medium density designation. Um, staff found that the request meets other applicable comprehensive plan policies for that requested change. And staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have at this time. We're going to open the public hearing for um, for this item A160006 and Z160016. I have two individuals who have signed up to speak. Um, Jared Edens.
No. Two means you're gonna vote for me twice for approval. <laughs> <coughs> it means peace, I don't know. Yeah. Two minutes, I'll take two, two minutes, minutes. ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jared Eden's comedian and engineer with Eden's Land. I'm here representing my client, uh, Dan Ryan Builders. Dan Ryan, very local, uh, local, very reputable builder in this market. They do a lot of the product that we're trying to put on this parcel uh, here tonight. I appreciate staff's support of our request so far. Uh, <coughs> I personally, and, and we at Eden's, we know this area very well. Our office is close to here. We've done uh, several projects uh, up and down Ellis Road. Uh, there's a good mixture of units there now. There's, there's, you have several different PDR zonings. I know PDR zoning, um, some people want PDR to include a mixture of uses, but you have different PDR zonings around us at different densities. You've got single family PDR, you've got apartments, you've got PDR for townhomes. Uh, to me, it's a really good area. I think it's a hidden little gem in Durham. I think it's up and coming at this Ellis Riddle area. Uh, so we like it there, so we like this project. Uh, yeah, I think the density works in this location. It's not unheard of. The 7.8-ish that we're applying for is, is not unheard of in Durham for a townhome product. We've done it several times. We have no neighborhood opposition that I am aware of as I look out into the audience. And um, be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Have another individual who has signed up to speak, Brent Lockwood. Madam Chair, Commission. Um, I'm a neighbor just around the street. Disgruntled, disgruntled neighbor. <laughs> um, just a few things I really wanted to go over that bother me about this project. Um, since I have lived there and even before then, um, where Ellis and Ellis Road come together, which is south east of this project, a huge apartment complex was built. Um, right now, uh, at Ellis and Ellis, there are townhouses being built, a, a fairly large number, I'm not sure exactly how many. Um, we have a huge uh, development that's been going on for the last eight, seven or eight years, right on Ed Cook Road and Ellis. Uh, you know, I guess I look at it and I say to myself, it, when's enough enough of development? Um, and I see they're, they're putting in townhouses. They're not putting in apartments. That's good. But where this, pro, where this um, I don't know if you can put a map up there, but where this is, it's, there's a turn. And it's a very dangerous turn. As a matter of fact, just this past Friday, there was an accident right there at that turn. Um, and there have been many accidents. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I'm about a hundred yards away and someone uh, died right coming out of my driveway years ago. Wasn't my driveway at the time, but um, it's just a really dangerous place and the way where they have the road coming in is right there in the middle of the turn. The other possibility would be for uh, Riddle Road to come straight across Ellis Road and come into their development and they could take that road, but that's where they're putting the buffer area in. There's a lot of traffic. If you ever come in the morning or in the afternoons, that wasn't 10 minutes. He has it? eight more minutes. I won't hey. take eight more minutes. I'm almost done. If you come down Riddle Road and come to the stop sign at Riddle and Ellis Road in the afternoon, there are cars backed up all the way past the railroad tracks. Now, I don't know if they would put a light in there, if they were going to run that road um, straight through, that's, I guess that's a possibility, but it's a major problem right there. Major traffic, major, it's dangerous. Um, so we got the congestion is one, the traffic, the curve. Um, you've also got that creek coming through, and I assume you guys have already handled that creek, but that creek goes basically from their north uh, east corner and it comes straight across diagonally to the southwest corner. So I assume they're going to redirect that. Um, 
Also, uh, 35 foot, I assume they're going to, they, I don't know if they're going to be two-story or three-story. Obviously, they can put three-story in. I'm on six acres just around the corner. There's a lot of people on an acre or more. But obviously, as, it, as it's progressed, people, they're getting smaller and smaller lots. But the bottom line is, is I just think it's really dangerous. I don't think it's the right spot for um, all those 180 plus or minus townhouses. Thank you. Thank you. I do not have other people who have signed up to speak, so I'm going to close the public hearing and give commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. Are there commissioners who would like to speak? To my right. Are there commissioners who would like to speak? Commissioner Miller, Commissioner Miller and Commissioner Freeman. Commissioner uh, Freeman, let me start with you. My question is for staff, and specifically around this this area on the um, side. I haven't seen a a buffer like this in a while. In, well, I don't think I've seen one, but um, is that how many yard? Like how much space is that between? the site access and this cul-de-sac on the side here with this eddy trail, I think it is. I'm trying to s understand um, exactly where the stream is and how much buffer there is. Sure, so I can explain the, the buffer part. So yeah. it's 50 feet from the top of the bank on each side. And there's a 10 foot no build buffer located outside of that as well. And is that crossing sand, like they're gonna build across that stream? Sure, so there's a note on there that says that is a potential stream crossing. Okay. Um, so I, you know, it could be at that particular location. Is um, there any limit to, because I know both mm -hmm. say potential. Yes, ma'am. So is it like they could do both or they could do one? Sure, they could do both. This gives them the opportunity at time of site plan, um, if they do want to install stream crossings to do so without having to come back for a formal rezoning. Um, any impacts on the stream um, would be handled at the time of site plan as well. So they'd have to mitigate any impacts into those areas. Okay, and then just for transportation as well for the, the, the area of the road that the gentleman mentioned, I notice, I've been around that curve, but there's a sharp curve, and it looks like they're moving, are they giving a, is there a, an increase of right away and then this left hand turn into yeah uh, bill judge with transportation they uh, applicant located site access point number one uh, to the south to try to maximize the uh, offset with riddle road um, so that um, long term uh, in order to get back to back left turn lanes in a, in a three lane section okay. so uh, that's why that that is located there. Obviously, at site plan stage, they would be required to, to show that they have adequate site distance at that location before NCDOT would, would approve that connection, and they are dedicating 20 feet of right of way along Ellis as well. And with the dedicated 20 feet, that's going into Ed Cook Road. Is, is there any adjustments that could be made for Riddle and, and Ellis Road that the, like the gentleman mentioned, I'm sorry, Mr. Lockwood mentioned? Um, more than likely, the, um, the right-of-way dedication would not necessarily be uh, enough for any sort of significant realignment of Riddle Road, but it would uh, potentially allow for some clearing of, of site distance around the inside of that curve. And what is the probability of getting a light at that intersection? Um, the, 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 uh, the rezoning did not require traffic impact analysis, so we really have not, I have not looked at that particular um, intersection in any great detail, but as an existing intersection, um, anyone's free to request that from, from our department at any time where we can evaluate it for, for signal warrants. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to call uh, the applicant up to this podium.
Jared, I'm concerned about the staff's uh, report where uh, the Riddle Road extension, it's my understanding that staff actually asked for 50 feet right of way for the extension of Riddle Road uh, and that you put in 60 feet and because there are 60 feet there wouldn't be a buffer between uh, <clears throat> the applicant property here with residential townhomes and, our, and the industrial parcel immediately to the north. Uh, my first question concerning that is um, how important is the extension of Riddle Road um, to beyond where it currently stops on Ellis? How important is that to your project? I personally don't think Riddle Road is going to get extended in the next 25 years. <coughs> it's my personal opinion. I can explain where the buffering came from if you like, because it wasn't it wasn't an effort to avoid <coughs> anything. Excuse me. Um, staff had asked for a 50 foot right away. I think reservation. Uh, if we had given what was re what was requested, which fine, you know, Riddle Road, even though I still don't think it's going to get built take our land, more or less. You give the land away, you're required to do, if you don't, if you just do 50 feet, our buffer would have been 80 feet on top of the 50. What, I mean, at some point, you have to make your, your land has to be developable. So to suggest to take a 50 foot strip of Riddle Road right away for road that I don't think it's gonna be built, and I know how things get built, and to take 80 feet on top of it was unreasonable. So our solution, partially worked out in conversations with staff, was to be give a 60-foot right-of-way dedication to make this a fair project for everyone involved. That would be my answer to that. So do you not propose to put any buffer in at all, even with the right-of-way? What am, I, what am I buffering, though? I mean, there's no road. So the answer is no. Okay. I, would, I, would, I do not, because the people who purchase the townhomes there in the future they already know that Riddle Road may be there, so I'm not going to try to pre-buffer because they're going to buy there if they want to live there. Is the Riddle Road extension important to your project? In other words, if staff hadn't asked for it, would you have offered it? Again, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I, it's not important to my project. I would have rather had the land and done other things with it. And did you have something that you wanted to add in response to uh, <coughs> what the opponent said? I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, it's Mr. Lockwood, I believe. I'm trying to search him out. Thank you, sir. I don't think we met before. I don't know if you were at the neighborhood meeting or not. Uh, we hear this a lot. I've got some random notes. Um, everywhere you look, it's development, development, development. I, for one, can't complain about it because I've had to fire too many people over the years because of lack of development. So for me, it's Christmas time because I've got a lot of stuff to do and I've got to hire people and we're all making money, hopefully, in the construction industry. I know the demand is there. Uh, I know people don't like to see, you know, the gentleman, Mr. Lockwood himself, said that he, he has six acres, but over time the parcels have gotten smaller. Even just the general parcels around here, over time the parcels have gotten smaller. Um, that's what's happening on Ellis Road. It's a desirable area. Uh, we like to make comments about affordable housing, and, and we, we like affordable housing and product options. and. Well, if you want affordable housing, if you give me more townhomes on a piece of property than single family, I guarantee you those townhomes would be cheaper. It's more affordable. Uh, there was a comment about road improvements and whatnot. We are doing road improvements that I consider to be off-site. We are helping the intersection of Real Road and Ellis Road by putting a left turn lane in there as part of our work. Uh, we do have to check site distance. I appreciate Bill Judge's comment on that because DOT is very harsh on checking site distance. They go out there, they measure it. If you don't hit the 400 or 450 feet or whatever it is, you can't put your driveway there. One comment made about string crossings. They're there. We do them as safe as possible. We minimize the impacts because it costs us money to impact them more. I can't help, you know, we're going to have string crossings. You know, when Foxwood Manor, which I designed, was developed, we didn't want to put that road stub in on that northern property line. That's why there's a cul-de-sac there now. Some of the people may live there. There's a cul-de-sac there that was but there temporary, knowing that eventually the, that cul-de-sac has to be removed whenever this road is connected through. So yes, we have to connect. We're going to cross. It's Durham's policy. Not every road or project is perfect. But I think this is a good one. You've got a good buffer to the south. <coughs> I'm sorry for being long-winded. Look at the stream buffer that runs 
east-west along the southern part of the property. That provides a natural buffer between Foxwood Manor and most of the density for this project. That's great. Look at the Riddle Road right away to the top. Whatever's gonna happen north of our parcel has a 60 foot right away between that and us. So I think we have a good project here and I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak? Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, my question is, uh, well, I guess for anybody, maybe Bill, Judge, uh, the extension of uh, Riddle Road, is that planned to extend to, uh, I wish, when I wish we had a rule when you submit something that it's big enough to see. Where is that? Where is that going to extend to uh, Glover Road? Is that, or is it just going to go somewhere and stop? Yes, Bill Did Judge with transportation. It would extend uh, to Glover Road just on the uh, the west side of 147, which would then uh, there'd be basically a realignment of Glover Road so that it would be continuous right there across 147 to, to provide connectivity in this area. Well, I, I would agree with Jerry that it's going to take a long time because there's some property to, to buy up before it can be extended. But I, I was just curious. Uh, thank you. Are there other commissioners who would like to, to speak to this issue? Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm going to, uh, at the appropriate time, move that we approve this item but I intend to vote against it uh, on a couple of uh, grounds relating to the comprehensive plan. Uh, my biggest concern is, is that what's being requested of us is the creation of an island in the comprehensive plan in the future land use map of, of, of a residential property of different density than all the surrounding area and the prevailing development pattern. I mean, to the north we have industrial and the comprehensive plan calls for that. This is not light industrial, this is industrial industrial. And then to the south we have uh, essentially a predominantly single family neighborhood, even in the PDR that's below. All of those are below four units an acre and this would be eight units an acre. Uh, and I just don't think that's good planning to create little islands of uh, substantially different or double the density uh, in in our future land use map. And that's essentially what's being asked for here. Um, so that's one reason I'm going to vote against it. I'm troubled by the lack of a buffer between residential property and industrial property. I believe there should be a buffer. I realize this real road request from the staff uh, is problematic. I also wonder whether or not there will ever be an extended riddle road there. Uh, to me, it would be more important uh, as a matter of land use planning to have a buffer here, uh, an appropriate buffer between residential and residential, uh, than to have a, a reserved right-of-way which may sit there for a long, long time and may never be used. Um, I understand what Mr. Eden says. Uh, if you wound up giving 50 feet and then 80 feet, I don't know how many acres that is, but that's a lot of property. Uh, I would be much more in favor of this uh, proposal if the proposed density was less and if there was an appropriate buffer in there. And for those reasons, I'm going to vote against this. Uh, the chair will enter, if there are no additional questions, Commissioner, the chair recognizes Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just going off of Tom's comments, I, I do have a question for staff, uh, which is how was this area uh, designated? What considerations were given when this area was designated on, for low density residential on the future land use map? I mean, it, just from the outset, I mean, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because the area immediately to the north is industrial, and I'm wondering if this was just kind of a way to describe what's on the ground there today, or was there some planning principle that uh, that you know, determined that this area should be low residential? 
Sure, Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Um, I, I, I was not with the department when this came around. Um, I assume um, my former colleagues did use some, some good planning principles in that. Um, I can say how staff looks at it today. Um, you know, we, we think about land use categories kind of on a hierarchy. You know, residential would probably be the lowest intense use. Um, and there's even um, you know, variables within that. You get single family all the way up to more dense residential. Moving up to in, you know, kind of office institutional uses, commercial and then industrial being the most intense use. Um, when evaluating this project uh, based on the size of the property and the density, um, I think you know, staff was of the position that this request seems to be some um, uh, of a better transitional use between the industry, uh, industry uses to the north and the lower density residential uses to the south. Thank you, Jacob. I mean, I would tend to agree with that. I, I appreciate what Commissioner Miller said, but unfortunately, I think that I'm coming to the opposite conclusion, which is that the future land use map in this area doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense and probably ought to be amended uh, for more dense residential. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, up against the industrial use there, and it, there's an even uh, multifamily designation north of that. Uh, and, and I think as Jacob said, or Mr. Wiggins said, uh, that it is more of a kind of transitional area and density probably ought to be higher uh, and so that it can transition into residential. I think I'm gonna vote in favor of this one. Um, makes a lot of sense in my mind and I would encourage other commissioners to do the same. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Ghosh and the uh, Commissioner Gibbs. <coughs> Just a comment. Uh, I'm glad that's all I have, but uh, th thank you, Neil, uh, Commissioner Ghosh. Uh, all, all of the comments have, have merit, uh, but I, I really, I was going to speak that about transitional area, and that's the way I feel about this. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I will be supporting this also. The chair will entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we approve. This would be two cases, uh, A16-00013. No, strike that. I'm sorry. Uh, A16-00006. No, quadruple zero six, and Z16-00016-1201 Ellis Road. Second. Motion by Commissioner Miller that we approve item A160006 and item Z160016, second by Commissioner Busby. Are you ready for the question? Um, Madam Chair, I have a question for staff. Can we do it in one motion or do we still have to do plan amendment first to make the zoning consistent? Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Thank you, Commissioner Bryan. Yes, that is correct. You would need two separate motions, one for the plan amendment first and then one for the zoning map change. Then, Madam Chairman, with Mr. Busby's permission, I withdraw the incompetent motion and then move that we approve the plan amendment A16-00006. I second. <laughs> motion by Commissioner Miller that we approve item A16000006 and second by Commissioner Busby. Are you ready for the question? All in favor of this motion, let's have a roll call. Mr. Yes. No. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Ms. Freeman? No. Mr. Harris? Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Van? Yes. Now the chair will entertain a motion. Carries eight to three. Motion carries eight to three. Thank you. Okay. 
Madam Chair, then I move that we approve case Z16-00016-1201 Ellis Road. Second. Motion by, motion by Commissioner Miller that we approve item Z16-00016, second by Commissioner Busby. Are you ready for the question? All Mr. in favor of this motion, let's have a roll call, please. Mr. Altert? Mr. Bryan? No. Mr. Busby? Yes. Ms. Freeman? No. Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Van? Yes. Motion carries nine to two. Thank you. I heard three no's. Uh, I'm sorry, you're right. Uh, motion carries eight to two. Eight to three. <laughs> Nailed it. Madam Chair. Uh, Can you recuse me? Chair recognizes. I only got to vote once. That's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Harris, did you? Uh, first of all, I'd like to move that we recuse uh, Commissioner uh, <coughs> Goosh. Goosh. From the next item. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Harris and second by Commissioner Bryan that we recuse Commissioner Ghosh from the next proceeding, Lumley Road Townhomes. All in favor of this motion, let it be known by the usual sign of aye. 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 All opposed? <laughs> now, Thank you. I have a question for staff before we go to the next. Chair recognizes Commissioner Harris. In our packet here, we just have the zoning cases. We don't have the plan amendment. So what would you like for us to do with that? <clears throat> yes. If you, if you will look, um, there should be a, a, a note at the top that you put your comments for both cases on the same. And the, and the written comments start at the bottom and they flip over to the back side of that sheet. So, mm -hmm. yes ma'am. Okay, mm -hmm. so the plan amendment would go on the same? Yes, on the same yes, that, yes. Mm -hmm. that's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, the chair recognizes um, the next case, um, Lumley Road Townhomes staff, please. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins again with the planning department. Um, this case is um, for Lum Lumley Road townhouses. Uh, the applicant is Andrew Porter. This is um, reviewed under the city's jurisdiction. Um, there's two requests as part of this item. Uh, the first is a zoning map change to change the zoning designation of the site from residential rural and commercial center to residential suburban multifamily. And to also change the future land use map as part of the comprehensive plan from medium density residential and commercial to medium density residential. Um, the acreage um, for the future land use map change, approximately two thirds of an acre. Um, the zoning for the overall site is 13 and a half acres. Um, and the proposed use would be any uh, use allowed in the RSM district. Um, there's no development plan submitted as part of this request. A context map noting the area. Um, the image on the left is the present day zoning, um, and the image on the right is the proposed zoning. Um, as you can see, this parcel borders the Durham Wake County line along its eastern side. I um, mean, you can also see the commercial zoning in the southeast corner of the site. Um, the site is generally located along um, Lumley Road, just to the east of Page Road. Um, an aerial view of the property um, from 2013. As you can see, there, are, uh, as there is a multifamily development located directly west of this site um, and some commercial uh, uses to the south of the site <coughs> along T.W. Alexander. The RSM district, um, the maximum density, since the applicant did not submit a development plan with this request, would be eight dwelling units an acre. They would have to provide a minimum open space amount of 18% of the site 
And the RSM district permits a range of housing types, um, be it from single family to multiplex housing types. Um, the future land use map, um, you can see there is a portion of the site um, in the southwestern corner, which is noted as commercial on the future land use map, um, which is the approximate two thirds of an acre. And the applicant is requesting to change that to medium density residential. Comprehensive plan policies were reviewed as part of this request. Um, you can see in front of you um, the future land use map. As I noted, there is a portion of the site which is commercial, which the applicant is requesting to change. Um, if that is approved, then it would become consistent with the, uh, the future land use map. Um, staff also evaluated um, residential and suburban tier policies regarding this type of development and found that the request is in harmony with the comprehensive plan. And that the staff determines that uh, both of these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and other applicable policies and ordinances. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the commission may have at this time regarding this request. Thank you. I have two individuals who have signed up to speak for um, Mr. Biker. Good evening, Chairwoman Hyman, Vice Chair Busby, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham. I'm here tonight representing Darlington Advisors for this item. Uh, with us tonight are Carlton Midget, the manager of Darlington, as well as Dan Jewell and Andy Porter, our landscape architects with Coulter Jewell Thames. In regard to the comprehensive plan amendment before the commission tonight, I wish to stress that our plan amendment application only covers 5% of the 13 and a half acre development we are proposing. In fact, when one looks at the underlying commercial zoning, one finds that the translation from the old merge zoning ordinance to the UDO was to CC, which is commercial center. However, the UDO mandates that any CC zoning district, district have a development plan. It is clear from the official zoning maps that there is no development plan for the two thirds of an acre currently zoned CC within our proposed neighborhood. Accordingly, it appears we are here tonight to fix a mistake on the zoning map. Since a plan amendment was required with the zoning map change, we held a neighborhood meeting at a nearby church and no one other than our team and the owner showed up. We believe that is the case again tonight. Most if not all of you on the commission have heard it said that Durham is pretty much out of good development sites. Based on our due diligence, the challenge with this site before you this evening is significant subsurface rock. Based on these rock conditions, we anticipate that we will be blasting in order to install stormwater BMPs and other infrastructure, and that is a costly undertaking. Given these difficult site preparation costs, it is impossible to state with certainty what the total number of dwelling units could be on this 13 and a half acres and that is why we did not submit a development plan. For these reasons, we respectfully request your recommendation of approval for the RSM zoning district for this site and also for the plan amendment that covers two thirds of an acre to change the designation from commercial to medium density residential. Our team will be happy to answer any questions you may have tonight and we thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Uh, Fred Snyder. Okay. Say the name again. No, no, in a mic. Fred Snyder. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. You might want to look at the the other form then. No, the other. We'll take a look. Just close it up again. Okay. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and give the commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. Are there commissioners who would like to speak? Commissioner Harris. I have a question for a bill judge <clears throat> with reference to the transportation impact. 
and I'm looking at table two about traffic generation, uh, where it's a negative impact on traffic of about a little over 1,500 trips per day. And is that mainly because of the explanation we have in there at the bottom, you use the maximum use of existing zoning? Yes, Bill Judge with transportation, we, for these tables, we always assume the, the maximum permitted uses on the site. And because portion, a small portion of this was commercial, it, it, uh, we utilized fast food restaurants, so that's why there was such a large reduction. Okay, thank you. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak? I'm looking to my left. Commissioner Hornbuckle. Mr. Biker, you could probably answer this for me, sir. Are utilities for this provided through Durham or, or with uh, Raleigh? Uh, Durham, sir. It's Durham. Yes, sir. And with your designation, if, if it is changed, does this affect anything as long with the border with the Wake County side of it? or is? No, sir. Okay. No impact. Thank you, Commissioner Hornbuckle. Commissioner Miller? I have a follow-up on that. Patrick, what's the property on the Wake, on your Wake County border? What's the property over there in Wake County? How's, what, what's that going to be developed as? How's it zoned? It's zoned uh, City of Raleigh. I believe it's in the City of Raleigh's ETJ for office mixed use, which is a combination of multifamily and office, sir. Yeah, nothing that would necessarily be a bad neighbor to your project. No, that's correct. Commissioner Freeman? I just had a question. You mentioned mm -hmm. that there were no more developable areas or no more good developable areas? No, it's, it's very tough to find sites that don't have problems, let's put it that way. Okay. It's very tough. I wish we could. Any other commissioners who would like to speak? If not, uh, the chair will entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we recommend approval of Case eight one six zero 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 one three. Second. Second. <clears throat> Motion by Commissioner Bryan, second by Commissioner Miller, that we approve item number eight one six zero 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 one three. Are you ready for the question? All in favor of this motion, let's have a roll call. Mr. Alter. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Ms. Freeman? Yes. Ms. Ha uh, Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. Motion carries unanimous 10 to 0. Thank you. Now I'll entertain a motion for the um, Zoning map change. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that we recommend approval of case Z160029. Second. Motion by Commissioner Bryan, second by Commissioner Miller, that we approve item number Z160029 uh, forward with a favorable recommendation. Are you ready for this question? All in favor of this motion, roll call. Mr. Al Turk? Yes. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Ms. Hyman? Yes. Ms. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. Mr. Kinchin? I'm sorry. Absent. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Motion carries unanimous 10 to 0. Thank you. Item, uh, public hearing, zoning map changes for uh, Village Hearth, Z160014. Staff, please. Good evening, Kyle Taylor with the Planning Department. Uh, this case was continued from the December 13th meeting to the February 14th meeting and now to the meeting tonight. Um, there is one correction to the staff report before I start. 
Uh, the applicant has committed to age restriction development, and as such, the proposed number of trips for the project should state 171 trips per day for the most severe use of this site now. Uh, the age restriction does uh, lower the number per unit. Uh, based on this information, the project would result in a reduction of 187 trips per day from the most intense use that would be currently allowed on the site. Could you repeat that for us, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the applicant recently uh, added with the most recent submittal of this, which is the version that's in your guys' uh, patch, a packet, uh, a age restrictive commitment. And age restriction has a different rate for trips per day than what the actual single family does. Uh, and as such, the trips per day that's anticipated for maximum use based on this development plan would be 171 trips per day uh, versus the 300 and some odd that's in the actual staff report at this time. Um, and the, this would reduce the number of trips based on the most intense use uh, by 187 trips. Mm -hmm. The applicant for this project is Daniel Jewell. It is in the city's jurisdiction. The request is from Residential Suburban 20 and Residential Suburban 10 to plan development residential 2.110. The acreage is 15.207 acres and the proposed use is for 32 age-restricted single-family and multi-family units with a community building. The uh, site is located at 1000 Infinity Road in the suburban tier in the EA Watershed Overlay District. I'm just gonna go over the changes that have happened since the last time you guys saw this case. Um, the major changes that have happened is the addition of uh, text commitments, the addition of, a, um, addition of a building area for a potential single-family home near Infinity Road. The note of the, on the existing driveway now no longer states that the reuse will be only for construction and maintenance traffic. Um, the building and parking envelope has been updated. And the note to the existing access point states that the applicant will seek the, to admit this uh, stub out at the time of site plan approval pursuant to UDO section 12.3.1.F.2. And then the Buttonbush Drive access now states that it will the access connection to Buttonbush Drive to include construction of public cul-de-sac or T-type turnaround and dedication of associated public right of way. The updated text commitments include the preservation of the existing driveway, uh, the, the maximum age restriction. Uh, that's just a abbreviated version of the age restriction. The entirety of the age restriction can be found in the staff report and also on the cover sheet. Um, <clears throat> proposed development as a series of single family and two family multiplex supporting buildings and all land not associated with buildings will be in common ownership. No individual residence shall exceed 1600 square feet in total floor area and there will be a maximum, a minimum of four residential buildings on site and a maximum of 32. There shall, be, there shall also be a community building. No more than five acres will be graded at any one time and no clear cutting as defined in the UDO. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies, and staff is available for any questions. Thank you. May I have the list of individuals who have signed up to speak? We can do this in 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, Dan, the chair recognizes Dan Jewell. Thank you, Chairperson Hyman and fellow commissioners, and thank Kyle for the, uh, the good staff report there. Uh, good evening, everyone. Again, I'm Dan Jewell, uh, Coulter Jewell Thames, 111 West Main Street in Durham. We are, we are here representing the, uh, the Village Hearth community. Many of the members of the, the community who will be living out here are, are here tonight. Um, but uh, out of respect for your time and to not rehash the same points that were made three months ago, uh, they've elected me as their sole speaker. I think there may be a few neighbors here who may speak uh, for and against, but uh, don't want to take up a lot of your time. Uh, we're back here after a three-month hiatus, uh, basically wordsmithing. Uh, the proffers that all came up at the meeting back in uh, December 
uh, the requests. Those were, and we think we're, those were all good ones. Uh, since that time, we made an initial resubmittal to the planning staff right after Christmas. We actually held another neighborhood meeting uh, back in January. Uh, we met again with the staff. We made two more submittals <laughs> we're smithing the proffers, and we've had numerous conversations with NCDOT. Uh, and we're back tonight with uh, what we think captures the intent of what you all asked for and what some of the neighbors' concerns were at the December meeting. Just to recap the key points, uh, Kyle stated some of these, but, but they're worth restating. Uh, the existing driveway to Infinity Road, of which there was much discussion, uh, will remain open in place and no conditions on gating or anything like that. So we just removed all of the language conditional on that. You may have a little discussion on that tonight, that's okay. But that will be part of a continuous private drive that goes through the community, into the community, and then connects back out to Buttonbush on the other side. Fol folks will have their choice of, of how they want to drive in and out of the community. Uh, we've worked out a very detailed committed element language on the age restrictions. I think that takes up 90% of the line <laughs> for the, uh, uh, the text commitment on the age restriction to, uh, we think, to staff's satisfaction. Um, and if you remember, that is a very important aspect, as Mr. Taylor reminded you, because it has reduced the number of vehicle trips by more than half over what it would be without the age restrictions. We've also added, as he said, those commitments to not clear cut, don't grade more than five acres a time, and we've tightened up the allowable unit sizes and types with no unit larger than 1,600 square feet. We've committed to the project being developed as a condominium form of ownership, not a subdivision. In other words, other than the units, the individual units who would be owned by the members of the community, all of the reigning land will be held in common as common open space. This also helped with uh, the concern over the future road stub out to the each east, which none of us liked, uh, that showed right up against Mr. Browning's property. And although staff is still requiring us to show this stub out, they've helped us with some language on the development plan that gives us an out at the time of site plan approval to make that road stub go away. And of course, it's, it's their strong intent to do that because they would rather not have that road stub out. Mr. Browning has been a very good neighbor to there. Uh, and finally, you can also see on the development plan that we have tightened up the, uh, the building area envelope uh, fairly substantially. Even though the site design is still not quite finalized, uh, there has been enough work by the community that they felt comfortable to go ahead and pull that envelope in, get it away from the adjoining properties, uh, further preservation of the, uh, the land down in the bottomlands. We, we know that there are still folks in Eno Trace uh, neighborhood who are not happy with a connection to the road stub at the end of Buttonbush. Uh, but we do ask that you commissioners please keep in mind that what we are not asking is any greater density than somebody could do by right today with a simple staff approved subdivision uh, and with the age restriction imposed on these residents, the number of car trips is reduced by more than half. Uh, the Village Hearth community and I respectfully ask uh, your recommendation for approval to the City Council, and of course I'm happy to answer any questions you might have at the appropriate time. Thank you. That ends our presentation. Thank you. Uh, James Taylor and Jim Kimbrough be ready to speak. All right. Thank you. My name is James Taylor. I live at 14 Hummingbird Lane in Durham. That's in Eno Trace. I just want to rebuttal some of the comments that was made the last time we was allowed to speak. Um, the rock at the end of the street, Boulder, so some of you went out there and seen them. Um, I built houses out there for 12 years. I never bought a stick of dynamite. Everything was dug up. I'm sure there won't be no blasting. Um, there was concern about the traffic uh, construction on the streets and stuff's going to tear them up. Kids are playing. There was kids out there when I built, and I never ran over one child. Uh, if the streets get dirty, and uh, we clean them up. The city makes us clean them. I never tore any of the roads up, and I did 10 times what these people are going to do there. So I just wanted to assure everybody that I did much more work out there than these people are even thinking about doing, and we never tore nothing up. Um, so I, I'm for this plan. Thank you, Mr. Taylor and Mr. Jim Kimbrough. 
Good evening, I'm Jim Kimbrough. Uh, my wife and I live at 1102 Infinity Road. Uh, we are in favor of this project. Uh, I just want to let you know that I think the developers have been over backwards trying to keep the uh, area as pristine as possible. There's a watershed uh, restriction on the northern part of the property. Our property is just due east of where this pro project will be. Uh, for those that are concerned about development, my wife and I did put two offers in on this property when it was under the estate of William Dunn. Uh, neither were accepted, of course, but we are very pleased with what they put forward, and we do honestly think it's the best value for that property at this time. Thank you. Could I get your name again, please, sir? Yes, Jim Kimbrough, K-I-M-B-R-O-U-G-H. Those are all of the individuals that I have um, signed up to speak for. I do have individuals who have signed up to speak against. Uh, Andrew Claren, Kennedy Rizzuto, and, uh, well, I'll start with the two. 10 minutes, all total. There's about three of them. It's about three wait, of wait, them. Wait, wait. And who is she? She is listed Sarah here. Anna. Kitty oh, okay. Rizzuto. And I only have two yeah. others. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the commission. Uh, I'm Andrew Claren. I live at 4804 uh, Button Bush Drive. Um, and I was just going to uh, cover some stuff that we've discussed previously um, and present uh, once again while we um, are not against the development per se. Uh, we are just for uh, them using the 1000 Infinity entrance and closing off the stub to Button Bush. Uh, this is an overview of Eno Trace right now. Um, there are currently three large cul-de-sacs. Um, you have Current Lane, Round Spring, and Warbler, all with less homes than what Button Bush currently has. Uh, so adding 32 additional homes would you know, more than double uh, the current traffic on the street. Uh, the main roads in Eno Trace all have speed humps. Um, you note that this says 360 daily trips because that was what was put in. I know it's been amended now due to the um, age restriction, so it's 171. Um, but those studies are all based off of the main access road, which is uh, infinity. Um, so if you consider that the majority of the traffic would be down Buttonbush, um, I, I just think that maybe a study should be focusing on, uh, on Buttonbush itself, not necessarily infinity. Uh, but that, that's something we can, we can discuss later. Um, so the, the current access uh, routes to uh, Buttonbush from infinity uh, without going through the gravel drive. Uh, there are two speed humps on the Lazy River Drive uh, and there are three on uh, Shade Bush. Uh, so adding um, two additional speed humps on Button Bush um, to deal with the more than a doubling of the houses uh, would mean a normal trip to the property would cross four to five speed humps depending on which way you come in, which is more than any other of the sites in Eno Trace. Um, I know that that's one of the things that was discussed was adding uh, traffic calming circles or speed humps as to deal with the increased traffic. Um, I, I'd like to point out that uh, the property that, it, that was purchased is, an, is 1000 Infinity Road, not 4814 Buttonbush. So uh, I know that, that the stub is there, but I, I would like to see that stub closed off and only focus on Infinity. Um, I have a question about the uh, thing that was submitted. It said that the existing gate was going to be removed. Uh, that designation was right along the Infinity Road. There are actually two gates on the property, um, and I didn't see that they were going to remove both gates. And so I know they said they, they was gonna allow for continuous traffic, but on the plan that I saw, both gates were not being designated as being removed. It was just the outside gate. And if the inside gate was to remain, you could see it's blocked with a chain. Plus, they're also saying that this is going to be a single family home site now. So I don't know how we're going to have a road through there that's also going to be a home site. Other things that I, I'm, I'm curious about 
Um, but since we don't have a detailed site plan of where all the homes are going to go, we don't know what we're, what we're looking at. Uh, this is the current intersection of Shadebush on the right, Lazy River going north, and then Buttonbush to the left. So if they were to put in um, you know, a, a traffic circle, it, it's not really going to be possible there with the other uh, residents' uh, properties you know, being affected. Um, and then this is another community that they said they closely um, mimicked, which is Eno Commons off of um, Umstead Road, and then this is South Riverdale. Uh, South Riverdale only uh, has six houses that were impacted by this development, and Hillock Place only has 14 houses. So, and the, the density for this uh, development was only 22 homes. So the comparison isn't um, what we think is, is really a true comparison. Um, and going back to the previous meeting, uh, I know Mr. Taylor touched on a few things as well. Uh, we didn't really have a chance to communicate um, back uh, on some things. Um, some of the comments were talking about traffic and people, you know, speeding down the road. And uh, one of the commissioners said that we should speak to our residents and, and our fellow neighbors and, and ask them to slow down. And, and uh, what we wanted to point out is it's not the residents that are doing the speeding. Uh, it's delivery drivers. And uh, for some reason, uh, we just have an unusual amount of traffic in our neighborhood. Uh, our kids are used to it. They'll play on the street. A car comes down, they get up on the grass, and they don't even get off the grass because they know that car is going to be turning around. I mean, it clearly says it's a dead-end road on Buttonbush, but we, we have a lot of turnarounds and, and traffic that's already there that usually is not destined for our street. Um, so um, I think that um, the uh, residents have also mentioned that they're going to age in place, so you're going to have an increase in uh, emergency vehicles and uh, just additional traffic. And, and December, they made proffers of construction going down the gravel road, uh, possible emergency vehicles going down the gravel road. Uh, that's you know no longer there. Uh, we did have another meeting, um, as Mr. Jewell alluded to, in January. Um, and um, we brought up the specific things that some of the commissioners had mentioned in December about a detailed site plan, some other stuff about building materials. Um, and we didn't see that in the submission, um, and we asked if he was going to provide that, and he said no. And so I, I asked very bluntly, I said, so you're going to specifically exclude stuff that the commission has asked for? And he said yes. Uh, so the, the overall um, sense that we get from dealing with uh, the people of Village Hearth is that they're very set on what they want to do. Um, they're only thinking about their residents. Uh, they're not considering other uh, people in the community. Um, and um, when we asked if widening infinity um, was... Uh, Mr. Current, I'm going to have to um, at least stop at this particular time to see there are two other people who have signed up to speak unless they have deferred their time to okay. you. And uh, that's Sarah and Jim. Okay, are you Sarah? Okay, and you Jim? Okay. All right. All right we can you. continue. Thank you. All right. Um, it, we asked if widening infinity to add a turn lane um, and not pursue the connection to Buttonbush uh, was cheaper, uh, then would they still pursue that option? And they said no. Um, so um, we also mentioned um, if uh, it was 300,000 was the number that we were that was told to widen infinity and put in a turn lane. Um, that you know that would work out to be about ten thousand or less than ten thousand uh, per unit over the life um, of um, the site uh, to add in that turn lane wouldn't that be beneficial? Uh, there were some comments made um, about people who are on fixed incomes and things like that, um, but th the main sense that we got was there wasn't a cooperation there. We we asked Mr. Jewell um, why they were pursuing the Button Bush connection. Um, and he said that this is what our, our um, uh, the residents wanted. So we were in the room with them, and we turned and faced the residents and said, is this what you want? Do you want to use Button Bush? Is this the, you know, what you want to do? There was some kind of silence, and then they said, well, if we're going based off what the, the developer wants. That's why we pay them. Um, we also asked, well, what is your address going to be? Where are you going to get packages? Is it going to be 1,000 Infinity, or is it going to be 48 you know, Button Bush, whatever? And they said, we don't know, you need to ask uh, the, the post office. 
So um, we don't feel that extending Buttonbush is best for our residents. Um, we don't uh, want, we're not opposed to what they're trying to do. We just want them to develop their main entrance, which is for the property that they purchased and not continue the stub that is Buttonbush. Thank you. Uh, I've got two minutes for Mr. Fred James. Is he here? He may have signed the wrong sheet as well. Is that Mr. Snyder? <laughs> that is Mr. Snyder, right? Oh, is that? No, I don't. No, it isn't. Okay. That's I have two minutes. Is that Fred? Look at that. Good evening. Good evening. So I'm a resident of Eno Trace, and I'll make it short and simple. Um, Could you I'm, state your name, oh, please? Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah Paul. And address. Address is 22 Pedal Star, Pedestal Rock Lane, Thank Durham. You. Thank you. Um, my concern is for the traffic, and I know that they, they put the number in half. 170 extra cars in our neighborhood is still quite a bit. I'm in the neighborhood weekly, many, almost daily, walking with my children, two young children. We don't have sidewalks. There is already a lot of traffic, and to have 170 extra cars in our neighborhood, I think it puts all of us at a safety risk. And I know they spoke about previous construction, you never ran over a kid. That's not good enough for me because it can always happen and the more traffic and construction that comes through increases that. So thank you. That's all. Okay. Um, that ends all of the individuals who signed up to speak. So I'm going to close the public hearing and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. I will start to my okay. Start with Commissioner Alturk, Commissioner Ghosh, Commissioner Brine. Let's go. No David. Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Harris, Commissioner Busby, and <coughs> Commissioner Gibbs, and Commissioner Hornbuckle. Okay, let's start with Commissioner Alturk. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, thanks to everyone for coming out and um, giving us your feedback on this case. Um, I, I want to reiterate a couple of points that, that have already been made. Um, uh, the first is that if, if this was not a rezoning case uh, and someone wanted to build on this land, uh, in this current zoning designation, they could build 31 single family homes. Um, and so the rezoning, uh, the proposed number of, of units is 32 single family homes. So it, again, so if someone wanted to go, th not go through city council, not go through us, they could build 31 single family homes and the, and the generated traffic, as the staff report mentioned, as, as Kyle mentioned, or it would be 360 daily trips. Uh, again, we, we heard that with the age restricted um, uh, commitment, that, you know, that daily, the daily trips will be reduced to 171. So again, if this was proposed, if this, if someone built without our approval, this would actually generate more traffic than what this is proposed, uh, than what's proposed today. Um, so I, I want to also um, reiterate something Mr. Taylor said. He's, you know, he mentioned previous development uh, in this in this neighborhood. So I was actually curious about the neighborhood, and I went to the city of Durham's website online, and you can. You can see where and when uh, most or when um, houses in Durham were built, and so uh, a lot of the houses on Shade Bush and Lazy River were were built in the late 1980s. A lot of the houses on but Buttonbush Road were built in the mid 1990s. And I mention that only to say that you know, at some point Buttonbush Road was probably a nuisance to the people on Lazy River, but it it seems like because the houses are in character, you know, are uh, the, the same um, density with neighboring houses, that there has not been an issue uh, between neighbors, and I think that this will be the case here. Um, you know, this is a, uh, a development that will look very similar, I think, to the surrounding neighborhood, and I don't think it will create 
so much more traffic that it will have an impact. Um, so, but I did have a, a couple of questions. Um, one for the, for the neighbor that spoke. Um, you mentioned speed bumps and you mentioned if the, you know, adding two speed bumps on Buttonbush, right? I, I wasn't clear whether you wanted that or whether, whether you thought that that was, that you didn't want another two speed bumps. I, I mean, um, yeah, sure, please. Hi, uh, Andrew Claren again, 4804 Buttonbush Drive. Uh, one of the, um, I don't know if it was a proffer, but one of the things they mentioned to help deal with the potential traffic impact would be traffic calming circles or speed humps. And so the yellow indication was just showing um, where those potential speed humps would go. Please, please speak into the mic. I'm sorry. Uh, the designation was just if uh, the speed humps were put in, the potential where they would go, just to kind of show the overall flow from the entrance to Eno Trace to the end of the prop, where the beginning of the property would be. But is that something that would be, that would alleviate some of your concerns, or is it something that you think is a, just another nuisance? Well, it, I mean, it would alleviate some of the concerns, but it would then also increase trip time for everybody that lives on Buttonbush. So it's, it's a good and it's a bad. I mean, it's got, I mean, it's, it's better than nothing, uh, but it would still impact us as well. I just had a quick question for Dan. I mean, you know, there, um, we, we've, we've gotten a staff report and from Kyle's uh, report that uh, the gravel drive commitment was, or the you know, commitment on the development plan was changed to not include construction and emergency services. Is that, what was the thinking behind that? So there was no thinking behind that. I will admit um, in all of our back and forth with, with staff, <laughs> mostly in spending a month working up this affordable or this uh, age-restricted language. Uh, I had forgotten that that was a strong desire of the, of the commissioners as well as the neighbors. Uh, so uh, even, uh, even though this is what got us in trouble last time, uh, I would like to, uh, if, if, if that's something that is still of interest to the commissioners to age-restrict, uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, limit construction vehicles, we'd, we'd be happy to do that if that's the consensus of the, of the Planning Commission. I mean, I think it's something that would alleviate some of the concerns. I know it doesn't alleviate all of the long-term concerns, but it does help with some, and so I, that's something that right. I would. And, and just a clarification to your, your, your question, uh, the, 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 speed tra the traffic calming was actually a, a request recommendation advisory comments from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee which we respond to and said we'd be happy to work with the neighborhood on traffic calming if they're interested in doing that. So you would be, sorry, so you would be willing to add, uh, would that be a, another text commitment that you would, that we would have to The, the commitment for? is we'll work, it, we'll, we'll work with the, uh, the, um, uh, the neighborhood at the time of site plan approval on that. The chair recognizes staff, please. So, Mr. Uh, Jewell, are you proffering something this time or stating that you will work with at the time of site plan? I'm proffering nothing at this time. Our, uh, our response in the written uh, response to the staff report still stands. So he's referring to attachment eight of the staff, uh, the staff plan, uh, staff report, sorry. Um, number three in the applicant response to that uh, response is what he's just stating, what he has stated in okay. response to the comment for that. All right, thank you. Um, the chair recognizes Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you, Chair Hyman. I do have a question for Mr. Jewell. Uh, just point of clarification, I don't think I understood um, the roundabout or what was being proposed there and where it was being proposed? I'm not sure that I... I'm not sure where that came from. We are certainly not proposing a roundabout. Okay, that helps. Um, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't see it, but all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, I want to respond to something that uh, you said in your presentation, and I forgot your name, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, one thing you said was that the Village Hearth uh, folks are hadn't really considered uh, uh, what the people on Buttonbush wanted. And they were only thinking about what they want in their neighborhood. Frankly, I, I don't think that could be further from the truth. I've seen a lot of development plans. I've seen a lot of uh, rezonings go through, and uh, they've essentially made every proffer that 
that we discussed uh, and that you all raised at the, uh, at the at last time we met. And so I, I, I don't even understand where that came from. Uh, they've opened up uh, the Infinity Road access and, and no, they haven't closed off Buttonbush, but I would imagine that the planning staff uh, and just based off of our UDO co connectivity requirements, I don't even think that would be a desirable uh, project from a planning standpoint. Uh, then, you know, the, there is, you guys had some concerns about a lot of traffic on Buttonbush. It looks like, to me, just eyeball test, it looks like the shortest route would be off of Infinity. I'm not sure why, uh, why one would choose to go the other way when the shortest way seems to be off Infinity anyways. Chair uh, recognizes staff. Yeah, just to uh, clarify, the existing driveway is remaining as an existing condition. It is not listed as an access point at this time. Right. If it were to be utilized as full access, it would need to meet street standards and be paved. But it is open for use. It's a private driveway. Is that correct? Bill Judge with transportation and our discussions with the applicant and NCDOT. I mean, if a resident of the development chooses to go out using that gravel, I mean, there would be nothing prohibiting or restricting them from that. But in order to, to meet the required site plan elements, which require basically the, the required drives to be paved, all that access would be shown via through Buttonbush. So. So, I mean, it would be physically possible for a person to drive out there. There'd be nothing prohibiting them. They would just be driving through a gravel, existing gravel driveway versus a paved roadway, which may be less likely. But oh, I understand what you're saying. Other. But it is still, I mean, it's not a, right, okay, I understand what you're saying. But it is still something that is available for, uh, for ingress or egress from the people who live there. So, I mean, I think it really does, I think all of the properties they've, they've added really do speak to the concerns that were raised and you know i i think they should be applauded for that that's all i have to say thank you commissioner brian thank you i think some of my questions have just been answered um it appears to me that we're leaving the gravel drive open so that it can be used but the key to this seems to be is that we're calling it a driveway not a street and if we call it a street then we get into problems is that correct that's correct thank you commissioner harris uh mr judge uh, is there any restrictions as far as traffic is concerned on the private driveway so no, the, uh, there are no real uh, city requirements for, for private driveway, so that, that all remains private property and any restrictions so would be up to the property So the 171 trips owner. per day could util utilize that interest way? Yes, they could. Um, other than, like I said, it's gravel, so it may be slightly, it, we have many folks that live on gravel roads that complain and don't, don't, want, don't wish to live on gravel roads, so. Um, whether they would use button bush, the paved access, or the gravel, I can't tell you. That would be an individual's choice. Okay. Commissioner Busby. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Jill, I had a question as well. If I understood it correctly, Mr. Claren had asked a question about the, the gate and asked if there were two gates instead of one gate as yeah, there's well a gate as... Yeah, there's a gate out by the street and there's another gate that's basically just a chain farther in. So uh, we, we've shown no gates on the development plan, so that's a, that's a graphic commitment. Okay. So <laughs> both will be actually physically removed? Yes. Okay. Great. And then the, the home plan on site, he, he also raised a concern about would that impact the, the gravel road uh, it, it does not at all. Uh, the, the, uh, the community has just said they have a desire to keep the option open of one of the units, just one of the units potentially being out at uh, Infinity Road. So it would use that safe driveway, and that's why we showed that cleared area by the street. It's not that they will, 
but uh, but they wanted to reserve that right. Great. And then one last thing, just to, to circle back to uh, Commissioner Al Turk's question around the construction vehicles using mm -hmm. the gravel road. I, I may have missed it. Is is that something that is in here in writing, or is that something that that you are willing to put forward at the appropriate time? I just we, want to make sure I understood what we what we did here. We are willing to put that forward at the appropriate design time if it's the consensus of the uh, of the commission, and and I have actually worked out language ahead of time so we don't have to belabor this. Well done. Thank you. Okay. I, I I can speak and say I think that would be a desirable. Uh, thing to put forward. I, I think that would, I know that doesn't deal with some of the traffic issues, it doesn't deal with emergency vehicle access, but certainly I think the construction would be a, a, another step forward in the right direction. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Hohenbeckel. Well, a lot of my questions have been answered, but I just, I have known that area when it was the Dunn Farm many, many, many years ago, and I feel more comfortable, I would feel more comfortable myself using the driveway versus coming out off a of button bush place. So I'm hoping that they do have that, that option does remain open for them to use that. And, and it's at certain times of the day, it would be, I think, much safer trying to get on the Infinity Road. It's a lot of traffic used on Infinity Road. And from that driveway where it is located, it would be much safer to get out from there than trying to come off of uh, Laser River down there in Buttonbush. So I, you know, I'm hoping that for my support, that's gonna have to be part of it to stay open like that. Let me recognize staff again at this time. Yeah, just to uh, clarify with Mr. Jewell, you just made a comment about uh, that you are graphically committing to the gates. Uh, simply not putting something on the proposed conditions is not a graphic commitment. So if you are committing to removing those gates, it would need to be as a text commitment. Yes, we will commit to removing both of the gates. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs. Well, a lot of my questions have been <clears throat> answered also. Uh, this is another one of those situations where it seems that uh, you know, every neighborhood has, has its uh, uh, <clears throat> it likes for things to stay as they are. And I, I don't think I've seen the level of, I'll say, stick to it uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, but I know some people in this, uh, this proposed development. And if I were going to have neighbors, they're exactly the ones I would want. They're gonna look after your kids by that, I don't mean they're going to babysit, but I, I wouldn't put that past them either. They're going to become, they could become your friends. Uh, there's not that much traffic, even when they do. I don't think anybody is a speeder unless Margie Mack backs her Ferrari out of the garage, then watch out everybody. That, that's an inside joke for some of the, the people in the, at Hearth side. But at any rate, I, I really think when this, I would like to see this, uh, this connection to Button Bush. It, I think you will find that you will be using that to visit these people. Uh, nobody, they're gonna want their privacy just as much as you do but at least the door will be open to, to neighborliness. And I'm not trying to play the part of peacemaker. I'm really trying to restrain myself. Uh, but they are uh, a good group of people. And as far as the design of the area, I have all the confidence in the world that what they have, you would be proud to even look at. Another, another point uh, in connecting to Button Bush, 
the end of that road now, and I said this last time and I'm going to say it again, it's a mess. Whoever lives down toward that end, you need to clean it up if nothing else is done. And I'd like whatever building Harside does, don't touch that stuff. Let them clean it up. And I said I was going to restrain myself. Uh, Thank but you, Commissioner. At any rate, that those are some of my comments. Thank Thanks, you. Commissioner Miller. Okay, so I just want to recap a little bit. I'm looking at your committed element number two here in the text commitments. It says the existing gravel drive connecting the property to Infinity Road shall remain in place. The in Internal vehicle, vehicular circulation will provide for a continuous private driveway network from Infinity to Buttonbush Lane. To me, and tell me if I'm get if if I misunderstand. To me, this means that for your residents, because this will be a private system, um, that you you will be able to drive out the gravel drive to Infinity or you will be able to drive to Buttonbush, and you will be able to drive from Buttonbush to Infinity. So if you get home and uh, because you forgot your sunglasses, you could pick them up and then go out the other direction without turning around. That is exactly correct. And uh, the, in, the, you're going to create drives on the inside, and those will be built to subdivision standards, or will they be private drives? What's your I'm not sure I understand all the rules here. Bill, maybe you could help me. They will be built to private driveway standards. Private driveway standards. So may I make a suggestion concerning the gate issue? Seems to me the simplest thing to do is in the first sentence of number two there where it says remain in place, you could add the words uh, open and, so the road shall remain open and in place. That's just an, uh, a suggestion that's two, a two-word fix for the gate problem. Uh, and now I have a question for the staff. If over time the gravel drive deteriorates and it becomes necessary to maintain it, will that trigger uh, any requirement that they upgrade it beyond what it actually is? In other words, what, what are they committing themselves to? Because gravel drives have to be graded and re-graveled from time to yeah. time. Uh, Bill Judge with transportation, that may be a better question to answer for by the uh, planning department, but typically you are allowed to perform maintenance ongoing with your property. So they can continue to maintain the gravel drive. They just cannot improve it or to widen it, yeah, um, significantly change it. Yeah, that, that is correct. He, he would be able to maintain it, but not improve it. Could they, uh, with this commitment, could they abandon it? Let me confer one second. No, because that commitment states remains in place, that it, it will need to remain in place. All right, thank you. That's what I thought the answer was. I have a couple of questions for you, Dan. Um, so the, just to make sure I understand, that single family house that you may build up there towards infinity would be a condominium. Its form would be single family, uh, but it would be part of the project and bound by the same system of covenants. Yes, sir. Um, and you still don't have wood in your list of materials. No wood on these buildings? No, there will be wood in these buildings. You don't have it in your list of materials? You sure? I don't think so. We talked about it before. I didn't see it. Maybe I missed it. I'm glad somebody reads these things more carefully than I do. <laughs> we talked about this last time. We did. So, so I would like to add that. All right. So we'll, we'll wrap up some. I thought you might. Yes, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Madam thank Chair. You. Are there any additional questions from commissioners?
Commissioner Bryan. Uh, there's been some discussion of maybe speed bumps or tables or whatever uh, on button bush. But I'm curious, I, I think there's already in the in that development in general too many or enough speed bumps. And what I'm getting at is I think for emergency vehicles and stuff, there may be some limit to the number of speed bumps and I'd it's seven. It's seven. So I don't think speed bumps is going to be an option on Button Bush. And I, I had one other thing I was thinking about. We all seem to be in agreement that this gravel drive is a driveway, and I'm assuming that it's a private drive belonging to the residents out here. Is that correct? So the private drive is an existing condition and does not meet the definition of private drive in the ordinance. So it's an existing condition. And how does it not meet the ordinance condition? I'm going to let Bill Judge speak to that. Oh. Yeah, Bill Judge, once again, we, have, we essentially have three street types. We have public streets private streets. Private streets are required to be built to the exact same standards as public streets. They're just privately maintained. And then we have private driveways, which are can be driveways, parking lots, gravel. This falls in that private driveway um, category. So it, it would remain, it currently is and would remain that. So there would really be no change to it. So there's no way in the future if these residents pull their resources and wanted to do it, there's no way they could, at some point in the future, pave this private driveway. Um, well, they, they could pave the private driveway. I, I believe the if they were to pave it, the requirement then by North Carolina DOT would be to construct a left turn lane on Infinity Road, okay. which they were trying to avoid. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the chair recognizes Commissioner Busby and I think this is first a question for staff to start. I, I think we're wrapping up our questions, but I do want to make sure before we put a motion forward, I want to make sure that I think it'd be helpful for all of us to hear from staff uh, basically a, a summary of the changes we've made this evening. Uh, I know we, and, and also to ask staff for their input, I know normally our policies say that if we're accepting proffers uh, and, and tax commitments, we are supposed to put this off for at least two cycles. We don't have that luxury at this point, so I, I'd, I'd like to ask you to um, share your input, but I also do want to make sure we, we are all understanding what has been proffered. Uh, and then finally, I do want to make sure we we make sure we wrap up the conversations to be clear about removing the two gates on the gravel drive as well as the uh, potential proffer on construction vehicles using the gravel drive as well. So th thank you for indulging my very long question. So to answer your question about what has been proffered at this time, the only proffer that we have received so far is the removal of those two gates. Everything else remains the same as currently on the development plan. And, and the wood material, is that correct? Well, yes, but um, the actual commitment that's on here right now could be left the same, and he could use a wood material so long as he used a minimum of those two that are on there. There's no language in there that would prohibit him from using other materials so long as he used a minimum of two of those actually listed. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that was the first question. Um, and then, so you, staff seems comfortable then at this point with capturing those proffers that, that we have in place? Okay. We would need to work with the applicant between now and council to work out exactly what the wording will be about removal of those gates, but yes, we are comfortable with that. Okay, time. great. And then finally, if I may, Madam Chair, to, to circle back to the potential proffer on construction vehicles, um, I can't speak for everyone, but I get the sense that the, the Commission would agree that that would be an appropriate proffer to make given the the concerns of the residents So if this is the appropriate time I will make that 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 proffer uh, I would word it as 
Construction vehicles will be required to use the driveway connecting to Infinity Road and avoid using Button Bush Lane. Pretty clear? And I've got a copy of this I can give staff and the sure. I would look to staff. It seems clear to me, but I want to make sure that that seems appropriate and clear to staff. And, and thank you, Mr. Jewell. That commitment is acceptable to staff. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if there are no additional questions, I think we're ready to entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to send forth Z16-00014 with a favorable uh, response. Second. Okay. Uh, motion by Commissioner Freeman and second by Commissioner Hohenbeckel. Uh, I'm sorry, by Commissioner Gibbs. I could hear it coming from that direction. Uh, that we move item number Z160014, Village Hearth forward with a favorable recommendation. Are you ready for the question? All, of, all in favor of this motion, let's have a roll call, please. Mr. Alter? Yes. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Ms. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. Mr. Miller? Yes. Mr. Van? Yes. Motion carries 11 to 0. Thank you. The next item that we have, uh, Watkins at Witherspoon, item number Z160007, staff report, please. We'll give the audience a few minutes to clear out. It looks like everybody's leaving. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, this request is Watkins at Witherspoon. This is located within the City of Durham's jurisdiction. And this is a request to change the zoning designation of one parcel of land. The site is currently zoned residential rural with a development plan. And the applicant is requesting to change this designation to mixed use with a development plan. Um, please ignore the plan amendment note on there. There's no plan amendment required as part of this item. Um, and the applicant is requesting um, a mix of uses um, as per the mixed use standards. Um, they're looking for a range of 33 to 300 residential units and a range of 155,000 to, two, I'm sorry, 105,000 to 255,000 square feet of non-residential uses. The existing zoning map is in front of you. Um, the left-hand image shows the current zoning, the right-hand image shows the proposed zoning. Um, the site was previously owned and operated by um, Witherspoon Rose Coacher, which recently moved to Garrett Road. Um, this property, um, as you may be aware, is now located in a compact neighborhood tier. Um, this application came in before that was approved, um, so the applicant has not requested DD, um, but they have committed to design standards as part of that. The requirements of the mixed use district. So the district in general typically requires a minimum of four acres. The applicant has approximately eight acres as part of this request. They are pro 
providing the required 50 foot transitional use area. The maximum residential density, if the 300 units were provided, would be 37.4 dwelling units per acre. The non residential intensity is a range of 155,000 to 255,000. And the, the applicant is also required to provide a phasing plan, um, which is on the development plan and also shown on the screen there in front of you. Um, the applicant in the first phase must provide both residential and non-residential uses. The existing conditions page, um, as you can see the site, um, the use is now vacant. There are a number of structures and other small improvements from the previous use, which those are proposed to be removed um, if this item is approved. Proposed conditions, as seen in the development plan and your packet, um, the applicant has indicated, uh, indicated site access points, um, as well as utilizing the compact neighborhood standards, and they are proposing to use a vertical integration um, as part of this mixed use district. Um, a general summary of some of the commitments, um, the range of uses, which I previously spoke about, as well as the phasing plan, access points, um, the applicant will be making roadway improvements in the area, uh, providing a bus shelter, as well as doing a right-of-way reservation for Go Triangle, utilizing vertical integration, and committing to compact neighborhood tier design standards. Um, a summary of some of those design commitments. Um, the applicant has indicated that it will be a creative and respectfully modern building design. They will have pitched gabled or flat roofs. Um, a minimum of one exterior surface material, as noted on the plan, frontage and setback requirements, ground floor glazing requirements, and that the building shall be um, articulated with a three-dimensional relief. The future land use map um, is quite blue. Um, this, is, this entire area has now been designated as design district on the future land use map. Comprehensive plan policies are reviewed as part of this rezoning request. Um, as I noted, the future land use map um, now designates this area as a design district. Um, staff did look at um, some of the other comprehensive plan policies and found that this request would be consistent with those. Um, the determination from staff, um, which is noted in the staff report, I apologize for putting lots of words in front of you, um, but in general, um, staff finds that this request does meet UDO standards for transit supported development. Um, so even though it's not necessarily consistent with the future land use map of the comprehensive plan, we do find that it is consistent with the spirit and intent of the comprehensive plan and that the, the UDO does recognize the need to permit developments in the interim um, until such a time that the design district zoning can be implemented. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the commission may have at this time regarding this request. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a number of individuals who have signed uh, to speak for. Um, since I have no individual signed up to speak against, so I'll just go down the list, starting with uh, Ken Spaulding, Dan Jewell, Dave Charters, and Michael Waltrip. Ten minutes. Good evening. Uh Madam Chair, Lady, and members of the Planning Commission, my name is Ken Spaulding, 7913 Leonardo <laughs> Drive here in Durham. Uh, I do represent the applicant in this matter along with Dan Jewell. Uh, this is a mixed-use development. We're hoping to have both office, retail, multifamily, and hotel. Uh, this was filed back in uh, March 14th, a year ago, 2016. Uh, the development is continuing to be a part of the filling in of the existing Patterson Place, which is important to our community's long-range development and to our light rail development. We made uh, sure that we contacted Go Triangle in the very beginning, uh, made them aware of our plans. We met with them early on, I believe about eight months ago, and we agreed to reflect on our plan, their requested need. Uh, we've met with them subsequently, and I, I, I think we have, have a good partnership uh, moving forward, and I think they'll speak to you this evening. Uh, also, I want to point out that uh, what's around us is mixed use. We're mixed use, filling in with mixed use, uh, and I think it's going to be something that I, I remember when Mike Waldrop was working 
on this many, many years ago. I was working on South Point Mall, and he was working on Patterson Place. And we were sort of eyeing each other and competing a little bit. Uh, but uh, I am so glad to see how that development has moved forward, and I never thought I would be a part of it as far as representing a client, but we're very happy to do that, Mike. And I want to say that uh, we've met the uh, requests and concerns and suggestions of planning staff, and we want to respectfully request your support for this plan. Uh, Dan, I think, will take over from here. Thank you, Attorney Spaulding. Uh, again, Dan Jewell, Coulter Jewell Thames, 111 West Main Street. Uh, our firm has been asked by our client to help them with land planning and preparation of the zoning application. Also with us here tonight, uh, my associate, Jeremy Anderson, who's the project manager, and I think you all know Earl Llewellyn of Kimley Horn, who's available to answer questions that may come up on that. Uh, the proposal before you is for creation of a mixed-use zone on this property. Uh, which will provide for a variety of residential, office, and or commercial uses at a density that is supportive of the planned future light rail system. It's a fine balance, though, between density that will generate ridership numbers that will help go triangle in their application to the federal government for funding, but still does not impose untenable levels of traffic on the surrounding street system, absent the light rail system being here in the immediate future. Uh, we're well aware of the current efforts of the planning department. Planning staff's been working hard to create a new compact design zoning district that will coincide with the compact neighborhood district tier that was adopted last year that you were all involved in. I've been actively engaged in this planning effort, uh, publicly supported the creation of the compact neighborhood tier last year when it came before you and the elected officials. While the adoption of that city county led zoning is still many, many months away and many public hearings away, I wanted to tell you why our proposal is very much in keeping with what we think this compact design district will be. First and foremost, we've committed to meeting the UDO design standards for compact neighborhoods and have also committed to some more stringent standards only currently found in the design district requirements. If you're familiar with these parts of the ordinance, you'll already know that these require things such as building placement being close to the street, establishment of an architectural podium height, building architecture, maximum spacing of openings, pedestrian accommodations, among others. We're further committing to standards including ground level fenestration of at least 50% for non-residential uses and 25% for residential, and having buildings occupy at, 60, at least 60% of the street frontage, so very urban. We're also committing to a vertical integration of uses and have established a range of uses and minimum and maximum square footage of, of each that still meet the mixed use district requirements. Remember that even though we have built in flexibility on what we will build and the ranges of what we will build, the traffic impact analysis is still the regulating uh, document with this development plan that stipulates the maximum number of car trips that can be generated by this development. In other words, no matter what we end up building, we cannot exceed the maximum number of trips stipulated by the traffic impact analysis by more than 3%, a tiny amount, without coming back to you and the elected officials for another rezoning. We hope you can agree that this proposal, located less than a quarter mile of the proposed light rail station, fits into the vision and mission of a transit supportive development, but without unduly burdening the surrounding roadway network if the light rail is not up and running in the near future and is worthy of your recommendation of approval to the City Council. Thank you for your time. Good evening, Commissioners. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak. My name is David Charters. I'm the Manager of Design and Engineering for Go Triangle, leading the design of the light rail project. We've had uh, active and constructive discussions with the applicant. As Mr. Jewell explains and Mr. Spaulding did, um, we believe that the development will be supportive of the light rail project with the station at Patterson Place nearby as well as the bus connector service that presently serves Patterson Place. So to be um, 
directly to the point. Go Triangle is supportive of this project given its connectivity and density that will assist the light rail project and the bus connection services to go forward. Thank you. I'm sorry, Michael Waldrop, uh, 5324 McFarland Road. Um, I just wanted to tell you that we were a neighbor of the Witherspoons from uh, 1984 on, and that was a uh, very happy relationship, and I look forward to welcoming the developer, the owner, Chris Howlett, and his family uh, to the neighborhood. And so I heartily urge you to support this project. This is going in the right direction as early as anything is else is in Durham. And so I, 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 I would like to see a unanimous vote in favor of this, if, if that can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have no other individuals who have signed up to speak, so I'm going to close the public hearing and give commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to start, I'll start with Commissioner Alturk, uh, Commissioner Harris, uh, Commissioner Freeman, Commissioner Busby, Commissioner Miller, Commissioner Gibbs. Okay, we'll start with Commissioner Al Turk. Okay, thank you. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I l uh, let me get straight to the point. I, I you know I think that um, I like the I like the density. I like that it's close to uh, transit options. Um, but because of those things, because it is in a compact neighborhood tier, because it is a transit hub, even if the light rail never you know comes to fruition, uh, the you know, the park and ride there, the, the couple of routes that I take sometimes, the 400, for example, from Durham to Chapel Hill. Uh, it's an important transit hub. But because of those things, I think that it is important for us to think about affordable housing. Um, and so I did want to, to bring that to the attention of the, the commission and uh, to the applicants. Um, I, you know, I, I know that under North Carolina law, we can't, um, I guess, require you to do anything, but I, I, it is, position, I think, of elected officials in the city of Durham, and, uh, and I think it's uh, that, that we want to promote affordable housing, and this is, um, I, I think there was a report that came before the commission, I think in 2015, I wasn't on their commission then, um, but it, it actually specified a number of neighborhoods and a number of areas of Durham that, um, where affordable housing uh, could be uh, located, and I think Patterson Place was one of those. Um, and uh, again, that was in 2015. I think it was a study by UNC, uh, some students at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, I know that there are a couple of things in the UDO that um, that are that that provide incentives for developers, and it's an, uh, I guess there's a uh, density bonus. I think there's a the um, lessened requirement for parking spaces, right? There, um, I'm, so I. I don't know those, I, I looked through them last night, I think it's section six of the UDO and section 10. Um, and then I think there's another option of in-loop payments. Um, and so before I you know, ask the applicant um, to consider these, I, I want to ask staff if these are the, the three, I guess, incentives or the, the ways that we could encourage affordable housing. Um, thank you. Jacob Wiggins in the Pine Department. Um, Commissioner Alturk, I apologize. I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Could you, would you mind restating Well, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't out of bounds. I know that we, mm -hmm. we can't require any uh, affordable housing um, minimums, but we do have an affordable uh, uh, a density bonus mm -hmm. incentive, uh, an incentive to, I guess it's, um, if they include affordable housing, they don't have to uh, have a minimum number of parking spaces. Is that correct? Which would then save money in the long run, right? Or, I mean, I don't, yeah. And then, yeah. And that would just be, yeah. Um, that would be for the affordable units only in that regard. The other units, would, they would still need to provide parking right. for those. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, I mean, that's all I wanted to. Okay. Oh, sorry. I, I guess I wanted to see if the applicant would consider any of those options. Commissioner Alturk, Ken Spaulding again. Uh, let me just say, well first, uh, my answer is gonna be positive. Uh, but I do wanna say this, uh, 
I don't know what the young people, I think they say, my bad, is that right? Uh, you would know, dear John. Uh, dear, uh, it's my mistake, I should have uh, brought that up because uh, the developer and I have talked about this quite some time ago and, uh, and that's something that uh, they wanted to, to at least show their commitment because he's been committed uh, here in Durham both on light rail and affordable housing. Uh, and not even considering at this time, not saying they wouldn't take advantage of it, but our decision was not based on some of those uh, ordinance uh, incentives or whatever, it was based on something he wanted to do. Uh, I think when we look back at it, it was about 23% in that district of affordable housing, and even if we built out what we were gonna do, it would be about 17%. But what we wanna do tonight, and I think, Dan, you have that already prepared, don't you? Uh, we wanted to be able to uh, do the in lieu part. And, uh, but one of the things I want to mention about that, if you notice, we have, I think, 33 to 300 uh, residential uh, units were indicated in that. Uh, that was because uh, the developer uh, owns this property and he's developing and will be working to get uh, users. Uh, they have a contract signed with. Uh, an office developer uh, who has a user standing by. Uh, and most, a good portion of this project development will be office. Uh, but we also want to do retail. We also have the possibility of hotel. And uh, so we don't know at this time, that's why we put the figures in there uh, about residential, uh, 33 units or whether it would be more. Uh, but we think it's going to be uh, a much smaller use than, uh, than what the other uses that we are able to do. But what we want to do is to make an in lieu uh, payment voluntarily, voluntarily, uh, of $25,000, uh, even with the 23%, 17% in the district or whatever. But that, because this could be used in other areas of the community uh, that it might be needed. Thank you. you would, do you mind if he reads that into the record? The, Madam Chair. Sure, Jacob Wiggins of the Planning Department. Um, I mean, the applicant can read it. I, I'm not 100% clear as to what the proffer is at this time, so it would be helpful to hear the exact yeah. wording of the proffer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dan Jewell again. Uh, I can't ask me if I would, I could do this. We've we've had a couple projects in the last couple of years where we've done a similar thing. So uh, the the developer will make a twenty five thousand dollar payment to the city of Durham uh, to be used toward the affordable housing program that they choose uh, prior to issuance of the first residential certificate of occupancy. I think that's been some standard language we've used in the past. Um, so Jacob Wiggins with the Pine Department. Um, so the, the commission has the guidelines or typically may recommend a continuance, something like that. This, there's nothing for staff to evaluate, um, so the applicant can make that proffer. Um, we as staff, I think in this case, would not recommend a deferral based on that commitment. Thank you. <laughs> can I follow up? I, um, I actually, I, I, I think that affordable housing advocates probably prefer in lieu payments because they can be used in other uh, areas, so I do appreciate that. But I, I was curious uh, how you came up with that number. Okay, the, are there other questions about this particular issue? If not, yeah, it's included in. Um, Commissioner Harris. Hi, staff. I just have one question. What is the maximum height? The maximum height of this um, proposal is 145 feet. 140. How many floors is that? Um, that's up to the applicant's discretion. They don't have to commit to a number of floors, but I think on average, one would, you could assume 10 feet per floor, perhaps. Okay, so 14 stories. Okay, thank you. Let me just double check to make sure that Mr. That Commissioner Al Turk got an answer to your question about the, I, I didn't, how they came if, up with the twenty-five thousand. Yeah, if you don't have a an answer, that's okay. Too. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Busby. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Charters, I actually had a question for you, if you don't mind coming up to the, the microphone on the podium. Uh, I appreciate you coming out this evening. As you know, you sent over detailed information that, that the Commission received yesterday from Go Triangle with a series of requests. I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, I'm frankly a little confused. When I got this, it seemed like you were asking for a lot of proffers or uh, specific commitments that I did not see in the initial report. And then when you came tonight and said you were in favor of this proposal, uh, I'm a little confused. So. Uh, can you help explain to me uh, what I see here in your memo, I don't see in this proposal. And so uh, I'm, I'm wondering what, what in this memo is, be, do you, is this being addressed appropriately? You asked for a lot of very detailed information about both the light rail and for bus improvement in this proposal. Right. And I'm not sure if I see that represented in what's in front of us tonight. Yes, David Charters, uh, Manager of Design Engineering for Go Triangle again. Um, throughout the day today, subsequent to the correspondence that you're referring to, we've had uh, very good and constructive discussions with the applicant to um, comply or make attempts to engage in the requests that Go Triangle um, sent forward yesterday. So Go Triangle is confident that based on the discussions throughout the day today, um, we've put together a letter of intent that we've shared with the applicant that is uh, agreeable to the applicant that we'll be coordinating. We actually have a meeting set up on Monday of next week to continue the discussion. So based on what you're referring to that we submitted yesterday between the uh, updated light rail right-of-way information and the different bus amenities, we're confident that um, the applicant will be able to comply and furnish those um, commitments. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. And we were just handed what I believe is a, yet another new memo. I, I find that encouraging. I will say I'm not prepared to then vote on this this evening. I don't, I don't have enough information to make an informed decision. So this, this is good. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the proponents being willing to work with Go Triangle. I think that's very important. Uh, I can't do my duty and vote for this with documents that I've just been handed. So when the appropriate time comes, um, I'm pleased to see movement here, but I am going to move for uh, at least a one cycle, but I'll, I'll look to the staff to tell me if it needs to be a two cycle uh, uh, deferment on, on voting this evening. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Chair recognizes staff. Thank you. Uh, Jacob Wiggins with Pine Department. So um, first I apologize for putting this one item in front of you. This was actually part of the email that some of you may have saw yesterday. Both of these memos were included in there. Um, however, I just noticed um, that the, the second memo should have been on the back side of the paper and it appears it didn't copy. So it's not anything different than you saw in your email yesterday. Um, in, in terms of a deferral or continuance, I think that's up to the Commission's discretion if they feel like they need more time to digest this information. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I first wanted to actually make a, a, a remark so that m make sure we understand with regard to affordable housing. It's true that we cannot require somebody who does not require a zone change to include an affordable housing component in whatever they develop under the zoning on the property that, as it exists. But if somebody comes and applies for a rezoning with a development plan, uh, we can, we are authorized by our city charter to say no, we can turn that, that rezoning down. Nobody is entitled to a rezoning. And so if you, don't, if you think a project should have affordable housing as it's contemplated in our plans, uh, and it doesn't have it, you can vote no. So that's uh, just an aside. But I'm going to vote no on this project um, because I think it's out of time. I think it's the, it's the wrong time. Uh, and I have voted no on other projects. We have undertaken a public process to turn this compact neighborhood tier into a design district. And that essentially is a community collaborative process uh, with stakeholders and the staff to decide how to rezone 
the whole thing using an entirely different set of categories in the zoning code. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to talk about some of those categories later on. When you take a huge piece of property in the middle of a design district and rezone it without contemplating the design district zoning categories, core, sub one, sub two, you essentially frustrate the planning process if, because you will have somebody who will be building according to one set of rules when you're trying to design another set of rules all around it. The project that gets built here will stay there for a very, very long time and you will have uh, you will have the problem that we had at Ninth Street, where we had we created a core sub one sub two, but essentially what's built at Ninth Street, none of it's built according to those rules, uh, and we don't really then have a design district functioning the way we want our design districts to function. We do not have to rezone this piece of property, and when I look at the Patterson Place, uh, I mean, I mean what's on the ground in Patterson Place in the compact tier and imagine how it will function as a design district. Essentially, we have a lot of big box stores uh, in there that are relatively new and will probably stay for a long time. Uh, none of them comport with what we expect and want in a design district. Um, and so it means that Patterson Place, even if we rezone it all to and identify core and support one and support two districts, uh, the fact is, is that the, what's on the ground will never function as, an, as a design district, at least not until these buildings wear out and we start pulling them down. Uh, this piece of property is not developed particularly. It's very low intensity. And the same thing is true with some of the properties to the south. We unfortunately don't have any pictures showing everything. But this is right in the middle. And for the same reason I voted against the Farrington uh, Road project, which was a great big essential dog in the manger of that uh, future design district, I'm going to vote against this one too. I would rather wait and bring in a design district plan, rezone, rezone this property that way then so that it can be built according to those rules, according to the plan that we've made, rather than according to um, another set of rules that don't necessarily work. And also, it will allow the, the team that's working to create the design district here. They won't have to design around somebody, a zoning that's already been granted. They can incorporate this into a real planning process. And for that reason, I'm voting no, whether we delay it or not. Commissioner Freeman. <laughs> I uh, thank uh, Commissioner Fo uh, Miller for saying all of that so I didn't have to. But um, I wanted to add that I really appreciate the forward design investment in Patterson Place's design in addressing, you know, busing and or buses and rail connections. But um, I want to be specific in saying, like, I, just some back of the page numbers, 33 to 300 units, whether they're affordable or not, uh, that would put it at like 4.95 to 45 units and 25,000 while it seems like a great benefit to have for the affordable housing process, I don't think that that would be beneficial in helping to get those 4.95 to 45 units. So I just want to be clear in saying that up front. But I just um, wanted to check with uh, Mr. Ken Spaulding. So I know that you noted that there were you had commitments from office, retail, and hotel. How confident are you that more of this will be office, retail, and hotel uh, as opposed to uh, housing or residential housing? Correct me if I'm wrong, please, uh, Chris, but pretty confident. Uh, what we have is we have a contract now. The reason why we would very much both strongly and respectfully request that this move forward uh, with Go, Tri Go Triangle and us uh, addressing more specifically, Mr. Commissioner Busby, uh, what you're talking about is the importance of that is this. Uh, we've been working on this for a year. Uh, everything was moving smoothly and uh, even about two weeks ago, uh, there was an additional request that was made by Go Triangle that uh, we're prepared uh, uh, to increase the amount of property they needed. Um, and I think they realized, as well as we certainly uh, realized, that uh, receiving on the 
day before the Planning Commission meeting, receiving that long memorandum and request uh, that we really wish we had had it before now. And because the particular contract that we have on this property, there is a user now who is waiting for the rezoning. And we could very well lose that user uh, if we're not able to continue to move forward, get this property rezoned, get the site plan done, uh, because that, that user could not only not be in our building, but could not be in Durham. And so um, what, what, I want, what I want to respectfully request is, you know, I have many times gone with neighborhoods and others to be able to get cases deferred and give us time to work with the residents. Uh, but we haven't had, and I haven't had a situation where a client really needed to move forward, and within 24 hours we received information uh, that we had not received, um, that we could have dealt with months ago. Uh, and I think, and, and I'm being very respectful to Go Triangle, uh, I really appreciate him having the regard and respect for us at this time to come to this particular commission and indicate that his willingness for us to move forward now uh, and we will work together on, on this uh, before the council. And if the council, we have not done what, what uh, we have come to an agreement upon, uh, then the council is going to hear about it, I'm sure, from Go Triangle. They do carry a lot of weight with them. We would just ask, just allow us to just move on forward. It'll be about 45 more days before we get in front of the council, and we do have already a meeting scheduled. So please, sir, correct me if I'm wrong that we're working together as partners on this to try to get this accomplished, and I think that you're in accord with this moving forward tonight. Yes, sir. And in regard to the, they're also, Deidreana, I mean, Commissioner, uh, they're also uh, hotel users that are flocking all around now because if you go out there you see how it's being uh, developed and uh, so we we feel between retail hotel users office uh, then we want to fit in some residential in there but I think it's going to be minimal now cr Chris correct me if I'm wrong because I'm just a lawyer you speak yes please be nice <laughs> I'm Chris Hallett. I represent the owners of the property. Um, as Mr. Spalding has stated, we are uh, we started out this project and we're looking at a, a mix of uses and the traffic impact analysis that Mr. Llewellyn did was based upon <coughs> certain parameters and guesstimates of what we could do and what we thought would come out here. Um, I have an idea of uh, what would what would be there, but uh, as often happens many times the cart goes before the horse and I didn't want to do it this time. I wanted to see what we could get approved. The users are out there for each of these categories. I know that the city wants to have a combination of housing and jobs and with the prospect of light rail, we've come to an agreement with light rail folks. Um, we are We are changing some wording uh, making some typographical corrections and we are looking forward to working with them to dedicate uh, the the right of way that they need and uh, to give them the additional land for the sidewalks as far as the apartment uses it was just a matter of the TIA whether it's going to be 35 37 whatever the minimum is or up to 300 we set parameters or boundaries just so we could get a TIA done. Um, you know, I talked with Mr. Spalding about this, but, you know, if, if there was something that could be done based upon a, a percentage or a certain number of units, you know, $25,000 for every 100 units that were ultimately built, um, he's going to tell me to shut up and sit down, but we are very open to that and would look forward to working with the city council. But we were supposed to come before this board, in our mind, in December, and because of retirements with the city and staff work and things like that, um, we're here tonight. And uh, the, the, the users that are there want to see performance by us 
to move this along and that's why we would request that we could get a vote tonight and go before the city council and work out these final items yeah the minimum number of apartments I, I think it's 34 37 something like that but Jacob Wiggins with Pine Department. The current plans show a range of 33 to 300 residential units at the site. Yeah. So just based on that one piece of information that you did add, I want to say that the 34 to 300 would be, if you were to be able to offer uh, 25,000 for each 100 units, that would be 75,000. And that sounds a lot better. But um, I really want to. Well, I offered it, so my attorney is not jerking me from the podium. So uh, we will we will do that. That's a great offer. We we. I grew up in Durham. I have a history in Durham. I know the situation, um, and I believe that. Uh, as I know, Mr. Waldrop and other people that are developing in this area also agree, we want to work something out that works for everyone. And that's the same spirit that we have with Go Triangle. And I want to be clear in saying, like, I understand the predicament you're in and trying to get this development through. And the point is not to prevent future developers from coming in and, and developing apartments or residential units. The point is to really make sure that around that transit area, there is affordable housing and to make sure that the developers that do come behind you understand that we need to work towards having affordable housing not just in East Durham but all across the city where light rail might be and we know with that plan already in place that Patterson Place is one of those places where land is is a high commodity so I just want to be clear in saying that it would be great if you could get 300 units of affordable housing in place but in lieu of that, the 75000 is beneficial to trying to make sure that there are other developers that are in place to do just that. Two things. Um, the good news is that the report, I think, that we got from staff last year was that the affordable housing uh, inventory in this area right now is about 22 to 23 percent, combination of single family and apartments. And even if you do the, the math, if we did 300, we would come down to about 17 or 18 percent, which is still above. Um, but I personally think the best way to attack this problem is for payments. I and mean, just uh, recognizing that with development and the market being what it is, you have to be mindful of the fact that just because we have affordable now doesn't mean it maintains affordability, which is why I'm saying to you that the 75,000 would go a long way. Agreed. One last personal thing that I may get in trouble about most apartment developers, I'm not an apartment developer, most apartment developers want to do a project of at least 200 units. So that's probably what's going to happen here. There's probably going to be somewhere around 200 or more. Um, so I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs. <clears throat> Well, my first comment to, to you, uh, the, the developer, is uh, I, <clears throat> I commend you for, for what you just said, and, <clears throat> and thank you. But uh, I was a little, I'll say, upset when I got, <laughs> I'd already stayed in my packet and looked at things, and then what, day before yesterday or yesterday, I got this stuff from Go Triangle. And I wondered, and I, I emailed uh, some people and asked, what does this mean? Uh, is, is this going to change anything? What's, what's happening? And, and in conversations uh, with developers, representatives, and uh, I, I see where Go Triangle and the developer are working together, and I don't really think, it, and they are making progress, and I don't, I don't think this thing should be held up just for our re-review of something that 
is going to happen whether we review it or whether you review it with city council. Uh, this is one of the, another first. I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first uh, development where the proposed uh, track of, of of this rapid transit is going to occur right on the property, and and it seems to me that it's uh, your the the request from uh, Go Triangle uh, is pretty impactful I, to me. Uh, it it occurs on both sides of the street with the bus uh, stops uh, and shelters and all of that, and then uh, changes in the right of way to to allow for the the tracks uh, to say nothing of uh, the parking rides. Uh, but I, I'm going to support it because I would like to see it move forward as long as uh, the developer and uh, Go Triangle can come to a conclusion and submit something uh, final to city council. Uh, I, I don't see the need of adding uh, more time because I understand the developer has has some people on the hook and and I think it needs to go forward. Thank you, Commissioner Gibbs. Commissioner Hornbuckle. Madam Chair, I'd just like to make a motion at this time that we proceed tonight with a vote on this project. At the appropriate time, I do have one additional commissioner who has asked to speak and I'd like to have some input from staff. Uh, Commissioner Ghosh, and then, well, let's hear staff first. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins. Thank you. Um, I would just like for the applicant to clarify what the current property is regarding the affordable housing donation. Thank you. The developer will make a $75,000 contribution to the city of Durham to use toward uh, affordable housing. Uh, to be paid by the developer prior to issuance of the first certificate of residential certificate of occupancy. Okay, I've been corrected. There's a clarification. <laughs> the developer will make a contribution of $25,000 for each 100 unit increment of residential units to the city of Durham uh, prior to issuance of the first residential certificate of occupancy for each 100 unit increment. Thank you. And we can work through the exact wording of that. That's sure. Well, I, now the chair recognizes Commissioner Ghosh. Thank you. I just want to touch on a few things. Um, one, I. From what the comments we're getting, I think it sounds like more people are leaning towards voting on this tonight, and I would encourage that. Uh, I do want to recognize Commissioner Busby's comments. I think they're valid in most, you know, I think in most cases would be valid. In this case, the proffers that are being sought are being sought by Go Triangle, um, and they're, you know, they're we don't necessarily know the wording of what they will be, but we do know what the intent is behind them through the memos, and I think they're fairly, I mean, they're reasonably understandable. I don't think they're very, uh, you know, complex uh, asks that they have. And on top of that, uh, we have a representative from Go Triangle that uh, says uh, with authority that they feel confident that they will be able to work it out with the uh, developer. So. Generally, I would say yes, I would, I would agree that uh, a deferral might be necessary, but in this case, I think we have some, you know, pretty uh, apparent circumstances why we should not need a deferral. So I would uh, encourage us to take a vote on this tonight. Um, I do want to touch on something from the development team. Uh, one, one thing I will disagree with was the general statement that payments might be the best way to handle uh, affordable housing. 
I think that's probably true in this location because we do have an inventory of affordable housing, but across Durham, I hope to see more developers actually including the units in their development. But in this case, we have uh, an inventory in the area, so I think uh, payment actually is probably the best way to address that. And finally, I want to touch on the comments from uh, Commissioner Miller about you know, waiting on this until we get the, pro the appropriate uh, guidelines in place. It is very true that we know that there's an intent to, to you know, develop more guidelines and, and give some more guidance in these design districts, but, or uh, compact neighborhood tiers. Uh, but, th I mean, in my opinion, the problem is we don't necessarily know when that's gonna occur. Um, and I don't, I don't see that as a reason why we should hold up development. It would be nice if we knew the answer to that, but I don't think we do. And you know, I think this project can be evaluated, uh, you know, for what it is, despite there not being, um, you know, appropriate guidelines in place today. Uh, so I intend to vote in favor of this because I think it's a good project, and hopefully we can get those. Uh, guidelines in place sometime in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Commissioner Busby. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just my final comment. Uh, I'm not sure I even have a second on my motion, so I will uh, wait for the appropriate motion, and I'm gonna vote no on the process when that motion is put forward. Uh, I just think we should have more time. I understand it's a unique set of circumstances, but I do think we uh, we should have the time to actually understand and deliberate and see what we're putting forward. So just explaining my, my no vote. The chair will recognize uh, Commissioner Hornbuckle. I'm ready for your motion. Yes, ma'am, I make a motion that we proceed to vote tonight on case 0160007. I'm voting in favor. Yes, that's a four. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Hornbuckle and a second by Commissioner Miller to move item number Z1600007 forward with a favorable rec uh, recommendation. Are you ready for the question? The chair recognizes Commissioner Al Turk and then Commissioner Bryan. I'd just like a clarification on the affordable housing, um, on the uh, the proffer. So 25,000 per 100 units. So if it's, if there are 180 units built, is that prorated or does that mean it's 25,000? And if it's less than, and if it's less than 100, is there a minimum of 25,000? Can we commit to that? The chair recognizes staff. Again. Um, Jacob Williams of the Planning Department. I mean, I'll give the applicant an opportunity to see if they want to clarify that. question that you asked. Oh, wait a minute. Thank you. Uh, prorate. Prorate. Yeah, prorate. Prorate. We're not trying to dodge it. Prorate. Yeah. Commissioner Bryan. Uh, I'm sorry that Commissioner Busby didn't make his original motion that he thought about. I would have seconded it because to me we're getting too many things coming at us and they're wording problems that I think are going to be difficult to work out. Uh, if we don't delay it, I think it'll get delayed before it gets to council, so in the long run, it may not make any difference, uh, whether it's delayed by us or somewhere down the line. I'm concerned about a lot of the things that Go Triangle has asked for, simply because I'm trying to visualize how this is gonna fit in some of what they want with some of the things that are required by the TIA and stuff like that. So there could be changes that we're not really anticipating at this point in time. So I'm also going to vote no simply because I don't feel I've had enough time to evaluate. If, I'm chair, move the question. I'm sorry, staff, staff needs to interject. The, this, the, the proffer that was made from the floor is not clear. It has not been reviewed for enforceability. It's, 
it, it went from something fairly simple that we could understand and enforce to now we're talking about prorated. And in most cases, and the, and the applicant knows this, we staff would normally ask for a continuance on this, but we were willing to accept a, a fairly simple proffer. Um, if you're looking at pro, prorating, I think that you know something maybe in the lines of a figure per, per unit versus per, per 100. So if it's $25,000 for every 100, maybe you look at 2,500 per unit. Um, I'm not sure, but we need something that we can enforce and we need something where we can do the math. And doing this on the fly, we would have to ask for a continuous unless we can work this out, so. Yep. Currently, the chair has a motion and a second. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I don't know if you want to recognize Mr. Spalding or if you'd like me to make a alternative motion. A substitute motion. I would, I'd Don't like to move a substitute motion to um, that we would continue this case for two cycles. Uh, but I, w I like, I, w I mean, the, if the applicant wanted to revise the proffer, we, we were willing to listen. However, I don't know what he was getting ready to say, but. I don't have a second for my yeah. motion. Second. Yeah. It has been, have a motion, a, a substitute motion by Commissioner Busby and a second by Commissioner Miller that we delay the uh, continue for two cycles. The item uh, currently listed Z1600007. Are you ready for the question? All in favor of this motion, roll call. Mr. Alturk. Uh, no. Mr. Bryan. Yes. Mr. Busby? Yes. Mr. Ghosh? No. Mr. Gibbs? No. Ms. Hyman? No. Ms. Freeman? No. Mr. Harris? No. Mr. Hornbuckle? No. Mr. Miller? Mr. Van, I'm uh, sorry. That's all right. That's no. it. Okay. I called everybody, right? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three. Motion fails seven to three. Three to seven. Motion fails three to seven. Did somebody not vote? Hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, the well, we, we need some clarification. They need some clarification That's what we've before asked we for, vote. So we, can we please get the clarification, if, if, if possible? Thank you. Uh, Dan Jewell again. I've been asked to try and offer a clearer, more understandable proffer. Um, no. If staff is ready, no. the developer will make a payment to the city for use for affordable housing, uh, $25,000 prior to the first certificate of occupancy, $25,000 prior to the 101st certificate of occupancy, and $25,000 prior to the 201st certificate of occupancy. I still don't understand. Jacob Williams of the Planning Department. Uh, Mr. Jewell, thank you for clarifying that. Um, staff has, uh, does not need to further evaluate that commitment. Yeah. Okay, then we're back to the original motion. Uh, motion by Commissioner Hornbuckle that we move this item forward with a favorable recommendation. It was second by, who was the person who seconded it? I did. Uh, Commissioner. Second by, <laughs> second by Commissioner Miller 
that we move this item forward with a favorable recommendation. Uh, item number Z1600007. Are you ready for the question? All in favor of this motion, let's have a roll call, please. Mr. Al Turk? Yes. Mr. Bryan? No. Mr. Busby? No. Mr. Ghosh? Yes. Mr. Gibbs? Yes. Ms. Hyman? Yes. Ms. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Hornbuckle? Yes. Mr. Miller? No. Mr. Van? Yes. Motion carries eight to three. The next item we have, um, item number eight, public hearing text amendment to the, Unite, to the Unified Development Ordinance, and we have none, <laughs> nothing listed. No. Number nine, public hearing text amendment to the Durham comprehensive plan and we have none uh, unfinished business unfinished business next item new business I know the staff has some new business for us right oh there it is it it's for information, not public hearings. No, it's not a public hearing. Thank you. One moment while I pull up the PowerPoint that I studiously prepared for you folks uh, this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> and I was told that it was good to do a PowerPoint so my head wouldn't show up as much on the TV. Uh, that's supposedly a bonus. I think that's correct. <laughs> so, um, but um, yes, I don't normally do a PowerPoint <laughs> for um, text amendments. Um, but for this item, uh, I thought it was prudent to at least uh, uh, walk the commission a little bit through the background of, of this text amendment. And I'm not going to go into detail about what's in front of you. Um, uh, it's an information item. Uh, at this point, you'll have it again to actually take a F5. Excellent. Thank you. Ugh, well, at least I can't see it. <laughs> and um, and um, uh, tentatively, at, we plan in April to have your, your actual public hearing. Um, so uh, before you is uh, the design district updates. Uh, this. Uh, just want to give you a brief history about design districts in general. Uh, many of you may be aware of them, but I'm sure there's a few of you who either would like a little more clarity about them or at least a history about them or don't even know much about them at all. Um, even before design districts, uh, brief, brief history, uh, 2002 downtown had an overlay called the uh, downtown design overlay, um, and it had many of the aspects that the current design districts uh, uh, have today. Um, it was the first to really emphasize form in relation to the public realm or streetscape, and it did utilize um, sub districts that the current design districts use. Uh, so more intense development in a core, and then it would taper out away from the core uh, to uh, less intense areas, especially adjacent to uh, non downtown uh, neighboring residential areas or non downtown areas. Um, in 2010, uh, the DDO was taken off the map as was the base zoning in downtown and replaced with the first design district, the downtown design district. And uh, then in 2012, uh, uh, a variation on the theme of the design district, downtown design district, the compact design district was uh, implemented and adopted uh, in the, comp the 9th Street compact neighborhood tier area. Um, just for your reference, uh, here's the current zoning areas. Uh, the shades represent the different uh, sub-districts. The lightest is the core, and then as you go out, you go into support one, and then at the edges, the dark purple support two. That's downtown. 
and then also for your reference, uh, you have 9th Street. Again, the lightest is the core, uh, and it goes out to support one, support two. The lovely Lavender is um, a special uh, sub-district uh, developed for this compact neighborhood, which is the uh, uh, pedestrian uh, business district that's specific to uh, that section of 9th Street, that business district of 9th Street. And a lot of this was reflective of the 9th Street plan that was adopted uh, back in the uh, late 2000s. So since the adoption of the design districts, <clears throat> there have been technical corrections. Um, you've seen them through the almost annual or biannual uh, omnibus tech, tech amendment, uh, technical changes bill, um, uh, bills. I've been looking at legislation a little too long lately. Um, uh, text amendments. Um, and also as the design districts have been implemented, staff has monitored the effectiveness or any issues that have come up that are a um, little bit more than just technical or minor changes, policy changes. Um, and so we began developing and starting to work on these changes starting back in 2014 and hence the TC14 uh, case number. So to emphasize, we're not rezoning anything at this time. We're not changing any boundaries. We're not changing any sub-district boundaries. Um, we are taking a look at the lists and considerate, or we did take a look at the lists of uh, issues and considerations that were developed by staff and, and other stakeholders and applicants. We even took on an additional mission of developing uh, specific street typologies that um, would be applicable only to the design districts at this point, but maybe in the future could be more applicable to other aspects of Durham. Um, we have had extensive staff and interdepartmental meetings and reviews. This is, this again has been going on since 2014, so we have definitely not rushed this one. Um, we have also had focus groups where we have had um, uh, design professionals that have worked with the regulations um, and design professionals who have not really had to work with, it just wasn't part of their uh, uh, job purview to um, uh, work with them and get feedback with that to get different aspects and um, opinions on it. We've had public meetings. Um, back in September, we had two public meetings on drafts. Um, and I know a, a, at least a few of you had attended those meetings. And we received feedback on that. And then we also have had JCCPC review uh, of these proposed changes. Uh, I'm just going to go down. I don't want to take your go into depth about this at this time. Um, I just want to kind of run down the, the hot topics um, for you, you all to pay attention to as you review this in more detail and um, pepper me with questions probably in April, um, if not before. Um, we are doing, one of the big changes is a, is a substantial reorganization where one of the big things we heard was that if we could consolidate more of the design district regulations into one area of the UDO instead of having to follow through with it throughout. And we've been able to do that to a certain extent. In some other areas, it just works out to, to works better not to do that. But we have, um, we are creating a new article. Well, Article 16 exists. We are replacing Article 16 with design districts and moving definitions to Article 17. So. We are creating one new article, but the new Article 16 will be called Design Districts, and the sections will be broken up in the, by topics. So as you see in your packet, um, hopefully um, uh, the first section is more general or use-related um, aspects. The second section will be uh, site design, primary aspects with site design. Third section, building design, and then fourth section, streetscapes, lotting patterns, and such. We did originally, and in, actually in the staff report, I indicated a section 16.5 and a 16.6, and that was the plan um, up to very recently, and I apologize for not deleting that part. Um, even up through the JCC, recent JCCPC review, we had those sections in there. We reverted those back to their original articles. Article 10 is parking, and um, uh, Article 9 is landscaping. It just, for those particular aspects, uh, it just tends to work better that if someone wants to find out about all the parking regulations, whether they're generally applicable parking regulations, no matter where you are, or specific design district regulations, it just, I, I polled a number of people, and it's like, in that particular instance, for example, it just works out for it to stay in one section. So that's why we kind of backed off from that. Same thing with landscaping. 
trying to prevent people having to do too much going back and forth, which was the original intent of coordinating all into one section. So basic highlights, I'm just gonna go through some main topics. If you want um, additional information, I'd be glad to, to uh, expound upon it a little bit more for you. Um, and even if you, and if you have like, you see typos, or you just need some basic clarity on things, feel free to email me, feel free to call me. I'm around. Um, I can easily fix those, no big deal. We, um, I don't wanna take up your time um, with those kind of comments, be glad to. And even if you wanna come in and meet and talk about things more substantially, we can do that too. But to get back to the highlights, so one of the things that we heard from DDI, it's in their um, draft master plan that was recently released, and even from the focus groups was creating more of a non-residential street experience in the core of downtown and along the axes of Main Street and Foster Blackwell. Um, not to um, prohibit residential, but just uh, focus on non-residential uses at the street level to, to activate it a little bit more in that core. Um, design special use permit, uh, we are removing those. We are removing that aspect of the ordinance um, for a combination of reasons. We feel that a number of the changes um, get at what has been asked for in past special use permit applications. Um, correct, correct. Um, there's still an opportunity if there's a unique site situation that um, creates a, un, uh, that the applicant feels is an unreasonable hardship, there's still an avenue for a variance. Um, we've met with uh, one group that um, I failed to mention that we also met with was DDI. DDI brought it, downtown, downtown Durham Inc. Um, they brought in a number of the uh, developers or developer representatives for downtown. Um, and we spoke specifically about design district special, uh, design special use permits. And um, uh, I, I'm comfortable in saying that at least 50% of them walked away feeling pretty comfortable with it. Um, uh, there's other aspects um, to, to why uh, we've taken them out. We've also left in provisions for still seeking special use permits for more targeted uh, areas. So open space requirements. Um, uh, one comes, is the one that comes to mind. I know there's a couple other and I'm just blanking on them right now. But um, transitioning into the next bullet point, there are new open space requirements. The, the current regulations do require certain types of open space. They're not called open space. They're called pedestrian malls or possibly even pedestrian passages. Even the, some of the frontage types like courtyards create a type of open space if you want to call it that way. Um, but these are actual specific provisions for larger development projects and is very and is consistent with the recently adopted downtown open space plan. So that's why that's being implemented. Um, we've also well, it, there was no specific open space requirement. I'm using quotes, sorry, but open space requirements at all currently. So the Dur the downtown open space plan said. Um, require minimum of 2% of the gross site area for projects that were over 80,000 square feet in building area and on uh, sites of four acres or more. And we're consistent with that. It's, we say three and a half acres because that lines up with our block sizing, but other than that. Um, and then service areas, we've really uh, tight, we've really, uh, service areas are the areas where, and we define that, where you might have loading areas or mechanical equipment or trash handling and such, um, and we really uh, expounded upon um, and, and, and prescribed the specific requirements, especially along street frontages. Um, the applicability of frontage types, um, uh, we, we've really tightened up how they are applicable or when they should be applied. Uh, the current language was, was somewhat uh, ambiguous at times, so we tightened that up. We've revised height allowances and provisions. We got away from a ratio calculation with streetscape to just set numbers. Um, and those numbers are, are um, consistent or uh, appreciate the ratios that are currently established, but we heard it from all sides that can you just give us set numbers and, and can work from there. Um, and then we also revised the provisions for getting additional height. 
Uh, we wanted them to mean something more. Um, a lot of them stayed the same. We might have adjusted how much additional height you got. So affordable housing, we actually bumped it up. Um, but, and then some we might have combined. So um, public parking and providing um, electric charging stations, we combined that into one and specified, gave more detail as to what you would actually provide for public parking, as an example. Um, again, uh, structured parking, we got into more deep, we kind of pulled that out as its own frontage type and made it a standalone architectural standards um, because they can either be standalone structures or they can be a component of another, of a building itself. And so we felt it just seemed to work better as these are the architectural standards for parking structures. And they also do limit where parking is visible on the ground floor. We heard feedback. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm very excited. Thank you. Um, plus, I, I want to get you guys out of here. Um, but limiting the exposure of parking at the, at the street level, and then also limiting exposure even at the upper levels, too. So it's a little bit more uh, compatible. It, it at least gives a screening of those uh, parking facilities at upper levels. Um, so let me ask you this. If, under the new regs, and this is one question I had as I read it, under the existing regs, if I wanted to build a freestanding parking deck, there was a frontage type for that. And, and there were a lot of requirements and what have you. Uh, if I want to build a freestanding deck today. You still could. I, st I can, but what is it going to look like? Is, does it no longer have to conform to a frontage type? It's not a frontage type. It's just a, its own set of architectural standards. The frontage types a lot of times focus on just the street level experience. It's a facade application. Mm -hmm. And then there's some general above the street level general architectural standards. We felt that it just seemed to work out review-wise and for even just clarity purposes to say, let's just treat parking structures as their own kind of beast. Mm -hmm. And how does this work? So uh, if I wanted to build uh, a something like the Liberty Apartments, mm -hmm. so one of these uh, four or five story frame on two stories podium wrapping a park, parking deck uh, irreverently referred to sometimes as a Texas donut. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, it's not a new one. The, uh, <laughs> and if I have, if my deck is exposed, um, you would have to be consistent with the requirements in the ordinance. If it's not exposed, if it's completely wrapped, yeah. then you're not going to have to worry about right. it. Right. So if if my if the deck maybe that wasn't a very good example. Say Solus Ninth Street, which I realize was not built to a to a design district standard. Uh, can you have like a, the apartments wrapping it on three sides, but a street exposure on the on the fourth side? And if it is, does that have to conform to a building frontage type? The exposure would have to conform to the architectural standards specific to um, structured parking, which would mean that you could not have, you'd have to have an active um, non-parking use along the streetscape there. So you can't have bays of parking along the street the street. Um, you can have them on that level, but they'd have to be hidden or non-exposed, however you want to term it. And then there would be uh, architectural standards for the floors above also. Right. So m that building then would have to conform to a frontage type on the other fr three street faces. Correct. I just want to make sure we're not driving the development and community into building parking, putting parking decks on the outside, no. the apartments and, on the in. And to clarify, at the street level, it would have to apply a frontage type. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're introducing a new uh, building type called incidental building types to address um, uh, rare instances, but instances that can happen nonetheless of those uh, primary uses that don't require large buildings that are feasible to adapt to applying a frontage or building type to. It's not a monumental building. Um, and it's, you know, if it's, if you have an urban farm going on and you need to do a greenhouse or a shed, 
you, you don't need to put a frontage type on that. So it, the current ordinance is silent on that, which is, can be frustrating. Um, so we decided to tackle that. And there's other aspects to it, too. Parks would, would come into play, and there's some other. And then we also did refine the general facade requirements. One of the things we heard about, the, the, especially from the focus groups, was that they were a little too prescriptive um, and didn't allow for innovation in terms of um, uh, uh, number of, uh, it, it was too prescriptive of how many bays or articulations you needed to have, um, uh, entrance placements and such. Um, so we revised those to not um, uh, reduce the intent of the standards, but to allow for a little more innovative design. So I'm kind of concerned about that because one of my criticisms of the the, the way we, the building frontage types have been applied, especially to these big apartment buildings, is, is that when the building is built, I look at them, I can't figure out what frontage type has, has been applied. Well, we're not changing the frontage. It's, a lot of these general facade standards apply to almost the entire facade, even more above the frontage type. You still have special, specific um, design criteria applicable to a particular frontage type at the street level. What a lot of these um, general facade requirements uh, apply to is they do apply a bit to the frontage type itself at street level, but they primarily apply to the overall facade itself above the frontage type, above the uh, frontage type street level aspect, if, if that was clear. I mean, I, Sarah, so, you and I talked about this, gosh, a couple of years ago about the big apartment buildings like the, uh, uh, a couple of the buildings that were built in the Ninth Street er, uh, area according to the design uh, district uh, regulations. And so I guess one, one or two of them had facades that were, that were um, the, the building frontage type with the, the you know, excuse me, the, uh, either the, the court or, or what it's, and some of them, it, like, it just didn't look like the picture, and it was kind of disappointing to me. Uh, are we going to still continue to have that? I, I'm very worried about the way the, the way frontage types are applied to these great big buildings. So to be honest, I'm not 100% sure I know what you're asking. So I think, because I didn't ask it very well. Can, can I jump in for a second? One sure. thing I didn't highlight, one of the big changes we did, and I, and I skipped over it in this third bullet point, one of the frontage types that we did change substantially was the forecourt. And you, the forecourt is probably what you've seen in most residential. And we did change that to get away from just saying, oh, it could be a raised court or a lighted court or a stoop, to actually say, we don't care if it's raised or lowered or stoop. You have a specific amount of forecourt, and you actually have to provide some amenities in that forecourt. So now you have to actually do possibly some landscaping and seating and some, some um, um, dimension and actual interaction um, required interaction with the streetscape um, entrances. Um, if it's with a dwelling unit, you have to provide access into the forecourt. So um, we have revised that substantially. We even reduced the amount of depth to the forecourt to pull the, the main building facade itself closer to the street. So that's where you see some, some substantial changes. So I, I would suggest take a look at that. If you have any questions, let me know. look at um, to I think this is my last slide um, we've tightened up the sidewalk requirements um, sidewalks are important in the design districts the design districts are as you've seen in downtown and we need sidewalks and good sidewalks in downtown um, and they are to be applied in the compact neighborhood uh, tiers where your future light rail and you're going to have kind of downtown light in many aspects, where it's also meant to be pedestrian uh, oriented. Um, so we've tightened up uh, the sidewalk requirements there. Um, if it's inadequate sidewalk, a lot of times you're going to have to improve that sidewalk if it's already existing. Um, as I mentioned before, we've introduced new street typologies, where we've um, currently Public Works has a reference guide for development. Um, we've met with them. Um, and. A lot of those are not terribly adequate for compact neighborhood design. No gravel driveways? No gravel driveways. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll take a look at the standards again and make sure. <laughs> um, but uh, 
uh, reduced uh, travel lane widths, uh, specified bike lanes and buffers for those bike lanes, um, uh, specific actual typologies, number of lanes to be and where they could be applied. Uh, transportation department has been uh, thoroughly involved with this, as has been bike uh, bike ped, um, even getting into some standards for intersections and such, and how um, the bike lanes would interact with rather regular travel lanes at intersections. Um, the last two buffers and the suburban tier, this is probably, uh, so street typologies and, and buffers, we haven't really changed much of the landscaping and buffering section. We did, uh, just wanted to point this out, add in uh, the, the buffering is silent now. It only references the urban tier, but we now do have uh, compact neighborhood tiers adjacent to suburban or even non-jurisdictional areas, so we needed to recognize that, so we added buffer language to that. Um, and I'm going to get, I'm going to say one statement about uh, future design districts in a, in a second. And then finally, one of the other big uh, revisions is taking a look at our bike parking standards. And you'll notice under, uh, in the, and you'll find those in the miscellaneous section again, 16.6 uh, .6 doesn't exist. You'll find this in, in the miscellaneous section. Um, new uh, short-term and long-term bike parking standards and taking a look at more detailed uh, use applications for how much is required of each and, and a total amount in a much more prescribed manner. We've recognized that actually the current standards might actually provide too much bike parking in, in many instances um, and for the wrong reason and for the wrong uses. Um, this will not be the end of the changes. Um, even if you have some concerns, again, if you have some concerns, please let me know. I'd be glad to address them even ahead of the hearing. Typos again. Um, but once council hopefully adopts this, there's, there's going to be revisions. It, it's just the nature of the beast. And also, when we go forward, and this was mentioned, a uh, good segue from the last case, when we start, you know, Patterson Place is the first one we're going to be looking at to rezone, um, and then they're going to be coming down the pike. We're taking a look at these areas on, on an individualized basis, and there may be additional, there might be an additional sub-district or two, or revisions to the current sub-districts that we find would be applicable in a general sense. Um, as we take a look at what the issues are, if there are issues, um, with each uh, new compact neighborhood tier. So um, don't be surprised that you see some technical changes after these are approved. Don't be surprised that you see some changes that are associated with um, the rezoning of compact neighborhood tiers. We, we wholly anticipate both. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I have a specific question concerning pay on page two of attachment A. Uh, paragraph B, we talk about ground floor residential uses and this uh, requirement about the finished floor elevation, et cetera, shall be at least 30 inches above the street grade. And I can't figure out why. Well, that's, that's current text, and that's just to give a little bit of additional height privacy for residential uses so you're not right on the street for, for if you're walking by, you typically do see uh, uh, ground floors of <coughs> residential lifted a little bit above, so you're not looking directly into people's windows. Sometimes you still can, but it's just not as easy. Okay, well, see, the thing that bothers me is this, this 30 inches. If I'm a handicapped person in a wheelchair, that's a real barrier. Doesn't preclude handicap accessibility. But how do you handle it on? There, there are, there are design, there are ways to handle that. There are ramping aspects and such that you can do. It doesn't, it doesn't preclude it. Okay, I just would like to it, see those in here if they exist. Well, okay, we can consider that. Thank you. Sure. So I have, I don't, I've been talking a lot. You go ahead. Oh, excuse me. Oh, Madam sure. Chair. Somebody go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say, uh, under the items for future consideration, I, I'm encouraged to see that we will eventually look at item number two, a, a fee schedule for temporary right-of-way closures. I know that's just becoming a bigger issue for small independent downtown businesses. So I was happy to see this on here. Obviously, 
we want to do it the right way. We want to be thoughtful about it. Mm -hmm. And I, but I wanted to commend that, and I also wanted to get a sense of, so these items for future consideration, what's the timeline? We don't these? have timelines for them right now. I mean, these are, these are kind of like three big ticket items that were kind of identified through the, this whole process that either um, we felt we were not adequate to address or just wasn't our, our primary purview to address, um, or if we did, it would just slow things down even further. You know, when we took on the new street typologies, that was an added thing that really slowed down the, per the, the project itself. Um, but we have already started to look into it. Um, Charlotte has a program. Um, I know they're currently revising it. Um, Lisa Miller was looking into that in a little bit more detail. Um, but uh, I don't have a time frame for that. Um, and uh, the, the same thing with multimodal TIAs. Uh, we're working with Go Triangle and the Transportation Department. Um, with those, um, we feel that those are important to develop to recognize the aspect that all our current TIA requirements are very motor vehicle uh, tra trip generation demand uh, focused and no or very little consideration of other modes of transportation, bike or pedestrian facilities. Um, and then, uh, since I'm on the topic, um, um, timely, uh, number three, uh, public trash and recycling receptacles. I know that's not exactly the, the sexiest topic in the world, um, but that is actually being uh, considered um, uh, with the city. They're looking to do a potentially um, uh, some pilot program for doing a, a more automated type of uh, trash receptacle collection system. Um, we feel it's something that's going to be needed, especially when you start because the current ordinance regulations require developers to put in uh, trash and now we're actually adding in recycling uh, uh, containers along the streetscape. Well, that's going to create uh, uh, a labor intensive uh, aspect on the city when you have one development go into Patterson Place and you have to collect those two cans. Mm -hmm. Um, but you don't have to collect any of the other anything else else in Patterson Place because it's all already developed. So that's just an aspect that um, that's actually currently being worked on. So that that actually might be the first thing that come that you'll see. Uh, you mo might see something in downtown and or Ninth Street. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Sure, Commissioner Freeman. Thank you. I just had a quick question for clarity on the park. I'm sorry. The the parking for bicycles. Is there any conversation around the reduction of parking in place of the bicycles? A reduction of parking in place so of the So the parking bicycle. requirements being reduced based on how many bicycle uh, parking spaces? Oh, are so required. motor vehicle parking reduction. Yes. Well, right now, downtown doesn't require any parking. <coughs> um, it's an 80%. And, and uh, for compact neighborhood, there's currently, it's 80% of whatever the parking rate is, but already in the ordinance, there is a provision for you get an additional reduction for the provision of additional bike parking. Okay. Commissioner uh, Miller. I know the design community did not like the old step back requirement, which was a one to one ratio. Tell me, help me understand how this new 10 foot thing works. Basically, it's a one time step back. That's, at at that's what it. height? Uh, when you reach the top maximum podium. So if you can go above, if your height allows you to go above the maximum podium, you have to step back. So, so for each of the sub-districts, we have a, a maximum podium level. Correct. And then we'll have a 10-foot step back there. Correct. You can make it bigger, but it's got to be 10 feet. At least 10 feet, correct. All right. Because I'm still... Of, instead of the wedding cake effect. Right. I'm, I'm uh, a little worried about kind of canyonization of, mm -hmm. of things. And we're, st we're still addressing that problem. And the other thing is, and finally, is help me understand uh, the way height limitations will work in the S2. So uh, the height limitations, so let me um, get you to that page and I'll find it myself. So that's one of the big changes. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, 15 and then... And actually also on 18, if you look at the CD. So both of those have the similar limitations. Um, so right now you have 50-foot height limitation, period. 
Um, some of the concerns that we've heard from adjacent neighborhoods um, and actually um, particularly from the Holloway Street neighborhood, which I'm also the working on the rezoning for that, so you'll, you'll see that soon too, um, was the massing and scale of um, buildings at front along those neighborhoods. So uh, we recognize that there may be, there's a net, that there was a needed l more height limitation when you're fronting along those non-design district areas. And it's not the entire property, but it's a certain depth back from the property. And then you can scale back up. Yeah, correct. To the original height. Correct. So in an area where the boundary between the design district and the non-design district area is not a street, but is the back lot lines mm -hmm. of, of properties, how, how will this function there? It's measured from the property line. Okay. I know it's measured from the property line, but, but uh, it's 75 it's, feet back. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you'd have that height limitation even against there. So if it's along a street where the zoning line falls in the center line, you don't measure it from there, you still measure it from the property line because then you're saying that, oh, part of the street is at 75 feet and you're losing, so, losing that impact or, or needed. Um, um, so in the CD district, is there any place where, I mean, right now it's a 45 foot height limit. For the, for the whole structure, wherever it is, whatever the circumstances are. Um, this will drop it down to 35, 35 feet, feet depending upon uh, the distance of the building from the, from the non-design district Correct. thing. Um, how now factor in affordable housing height bonus in, in that same S2 district under these circumstances? You can still utilize it. And and what is it? It's uh, the height bonus would be oh fifteen feet. You, you essentially Four can feet. add a, you yeah. can add a floor. Yeah. Yes. And um, then the the la explain to me how step backs work. Do we still require a step back in S two when the height risk requirement's only thirty five feet? Uh, yes, because the maximum podium. I'm sorry, when it's 45, the maximum podium is 45 feet, so if you're going above it, then you're going to have to do a step back. Mm -hmm. in, any, in any provision where you're at getting additional height, if you're going above the maximum podium, you still need to do that 10-foot step back. Mm -hmm. All right, very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we'll do this again in a month. Mm -hmm. Then you get the vote. But then you get the vote on it. Who was part of the vote? Um, we should have the chair. We so I'm sorry, I was. I'm already okay, gonna so have to take this with me to keep it. Two, the one through <laughs> that was. You did very nice. Man, I'm telling you, you guys. Scott Harmon.